Okay, so topos theory. In my opinion, it's one of the most interesting and applicable areas in all of mathematics. Most of mathematics, as it's currently considered, is really going on in this kind of arena of set theory. I mean, so many things mathematicians think about are in terms of sets. So many theories are based on the idea of sets. And so sometimes when you're doing mathematics, you kind of feel like you're sort of trapped in this little box called set theory. Well, OK, it's not a little box. It's a very big box, but it's still a box. We're still most of the time when we're thinking about maths, we're thinking about elements and sets and all the rest of it. Well, topos theory lets us break out of the box. It lets us do mathematics in a much more general arena. It lets us take all of our understanding of things in terms of sets and generalize them so that we can get them to a point where we can apply them to all sorts of other different kinds of structures effortlessly, like graphs or continuous spaces or things to do with quantum mechanics or dynamical systems or simple or or constructions made out of high dimensional simplexes we can take all of our kind of knowledge and then just express it in this kind of superior language which is topos theory and then understand how what we've learned applies to all of these different kinds of systems so if you think about ex ideas from set theory like that you have a set and you have a subset of it well, we can express these kind of ideas in terms of topos theory and we can just use them to talk about much more sort of structured ideas. But we're using the same language. We're essentially extracting out the important underlying kind of logical connections between things in such a way that we arrive at this kind of language that can describe all of these different kinds of systems simultaneously. OK, um, essentially, the goal here really is to get a new way of thinking of mathematics, a new kind of language that we can use so that we can describe things and use our set theory intuition. But we end up with a description that can apply to all these other different kinds of systems. And also, I mean, set itself, set theory can be considered to be happening in a particular topos with a particular structure. So what we can do is basically see what's happening in set theory and understand it at a more general level. And then it's also quite useful for studying set theory itself. I mean, something I sometimes think is that you don't really understand the theory until you've generalized it. And it often seems kind of difficult to think, how would you generalize set theory if you already think in set theory? But we're going to break out of this box, OK? This is one of the purposes of topos theory. And so this video is quite a long one. I've thrown a lot of material into this. And basically, the idea is that we're hopefully going to understand enough results that we can start to do mathematics on the kind of level of topos theory so that when we want to express things, we don't have to write them in terms of set theory because we understand how all the logical operations and all the kind of things that we want to say in set theory could be said in topos theory. Now, this is a very kind of ambitious goal. And um, this video has a, a very lot of different things in it. And it's really sort of taking steps towards this kind of goal. So one of the greatest things about topos theory is we really start to understand what logic is. OK, so let's say you have a statement like a person is a woman and they are a mathematician. OK, so we can understand that in terms of logic. OK. It's true that this person's a woman and it's true that they're a mathematician. But another way we can approach this is using a kind of set theory approach. We'd say, well, we're talking about the set of people. And then there's a subset of this, which is the set of women. 
and there's a subset of this which is a set of mathematicians and then this particular person is an element that belongs to the intersection of these two sets okay so we have this sort of parallel between set theory thinking and logic now one of the most interesting things about topos theory is it really lets us understand this kind of connection between these two things and so when we deal with a topos we are basically able to talk about these kind of things which are involving for us these kind of objects and arrows which is a, the real way that you know we like to think about set theory but then there's a sort of parallel to this which is involving kind of arrows which are going um, to do with this kind of so-called sub-object classifier and this is a fascinating object which is present in a topos and it essentially gives us a way to think about logic going on in that topos okay and so we're going to understand this relationship but we're not just going to understand it in the category of sets. We're going to understand how it applies in a much more general kind of context. So once you have this kind of thing going on, the desire is always to try and understand how you can say the things that you can normally say in logic, the things that you can normally say in set theory in this more general arena. And so this is our goal with Topos theory. We really want to understand how we can talk about all the different things in logic, how we can talk about the different things in set theory. And essentially, we really want to unroll this kind of it's, um, you know, getting towards a sort of perfect language for mathematical discourse. OK. Um, and so in this video, I want to sort of take steps towards that and concretely. I'd say there's really three different goals. Um, one goal is to tell you about the different kinds of logical operations which are present. And that's what I do really in what I consider the sort of second part of this video. Um, and then another thing I do in the third part of this video is I try and take a kind of overview of topos theory because it's um, really rather a vast subject with a lot of fairly abstract matter in it. And um, some of the most interesting things in it um, take quite a bit of uh, effort to build up to in a kind of rigorous sense. So I thought it would be good to you know towards the end of this video speed things up a bit and we can sort of quickly fly over this kind of landscape of topos theory and have a look at some of the general results things like what people call the fundamental theorem of topos theory and these kind of very general results which give us some very interesting ways of looking at kind of what objects are so one example which I think is very interesting is if you have a set, say with two elements, then you can consider the collection of subsets. And then you can form and then you can form this kind of partially ordered set where you just draw an arrow from one subset to another when the first is contained in the second. And then if you construct those kind of things, which you can do in general, for general kinds of objects in a topos, you can look at all the kind of sub-objects and how they're ordered by containment. And that gives you a structure, but then by looking at the arrows in that kind of structure, you can sort of quickly define um, these different types of logical operations like and or not and so on um, and it's very interesting to be able to do that kind of thing i mean it's has it's very interesting to be able to do that kind of thing 
and it gives us a sort of very nice kind of global perspective on what's going on in topos theory. I mean, it's really quite mind blowing actually, because when you think of one of these toposes, like for example, the category of sets, it has all these objects and these arrows, but then you start to see that every object has this sort of anatomy. It has this sort of um, structure, which is sort of telling you about how the, all the bits and pieces inside it are contained within one another and how one can sort of do logic inside that. And then all the arrows between objects in the category allow you to sort of um, go from the kind of internal logic of one object involving its pieces to the internal logic of another object involving its pieces. So it's, it's almost as if every like object in your topos has all of this kind of thinking going on inside itself and all the arrows are like ways that these objects are talking to each other. It's, it's really quite fascinating. Um, so this is this idea of forming these kind of so-called hating algebras by looking at the sub-objects of a particular object and how they're contained within one another. So we'll get on to that um, in part three of the video and we'll sort of quickly go through other kinds of um, fairly deep ideas in topos theory rather quickly. Um, so the other thing I want to do in the first part of this video is essentially go through some of topos theory in a more kind of systematic way. Okay, because one of my favorite books about topos theory is Elementary Categories, Elementary Toposes by Colin McCarty. And in this book, um, he very kind of systematically builds up um, topos theory. And he does it in a way, so he just introduces a few of the concepts um, but, you know, with sort of proofs and things so that you really sort of understand what's going on. And then he uses that as a kind of launch pad for talking about something called the mitchell benabau language. I hope I'm pronouncing the, um, I hope I'm pronouncing the author's names properly. So the idea of mitchell benabau language is basically it kind of looks like you're doing set theory or logic. You have the usual sort of symbols that you use in ordinary mathematics, but you're actually talking about toposes. You're actually doing something called intu intuitionistic logic, which is like a sort of generalization of logic. And with the mitchell benabau language, we can basically take our understanding of set theory and our kind of um, ability to reason using our normal symbols, but we'll be talking about general topos theory. And using the mitchell benabau language, you can sort of bootstrap and build up the understanding of, you know, what the rest of topos theory is about. So um, Colin McCarthy takes this approach that he just defines a few type of um, ideas and what they mean in, um, in topos theory, like the idea of and and the idea of implies and the idea of for all and then uses those things to set up this or define how this mitchell benabau language works and then uses this to go all over the place and define all the rest of um, the operations in topos theory and it's a very elegant approach because essentially once you've got to here you can just sort of do ordinary kinds of logic operations which we're quite familiar with and use all that to understand so much about topos theory but it's not sort of dry logic because yes we're doing manipulations of these logical symbols and things but um, once we get to this point which hopefully will be in the next video I do, I'll be introducing the mitchell benabau language. And once we get to that point, um, we'll be able to talk about things by manipulating logical symbols. But underneath it, there's going to be all this kind of object based, space based interpretation of what's going on. And there are so many good reasons to learn about topos theory. I mean, I would say it's pretty kind of essential, really 
if you want to really understand like the foundations of mathematics because you know when you start really drilling down to the foundations of mathematics you get to a point where you start thinking well okay it's based on set theory but you know where do sets come from where do the rules of set theory come from what where does the idea of the intersection of things come from these are the kind of ideas which are kind of too um you know you can only understand them so deeply if you stay in set theory but if you start looking at things in terms of topos theory you get um, you can go much much deeper into these ideas so foundations of maths is one good reason to study topos theory um people use topos theory a lot to do other kinds of maths like to understand things about topology um another great reason to study topos theory is if you want to understand the continuum. Okay, so um, there's something called synthetic differential geometry, where you basically um, want to have a nice theory of continuous mathematics, but you want to have a really nice theory of continuous mathematics. You don't want one that's based on this idea of a real number line uh, necessarily. You'd rather have a kind of even better behaved idea of a continuum. And in order to do that, you really have to transcend this normal idea of set theory um, and you can do it and then you get lots of nice payoffs for example you can think of a kind of object which encodes all of the continuous maps from one object to another and this is um, a really useful thing to be able to do so this um, synthetic differential geometry is extremely useful because we can take for example this idea of infinitesimals um, which is so useful for calculus and by sort of going a little bit outside of set theory we can make a kind of more um, user-friendly type of theory of continuous spaces for example one of the ideas in calculus is that um, you like to think about cases where numbers get so small that if you square them you can just sort of forget about them because they're so tiny um, and with this idea of synthetic differential geometry, we can really make a kind of idea of a continuum where that kind of thing really happens. OK, we can imagine infinitesimals, which really do have a property that if we square them, we get zero. Um, and so this is sort of slightly outside of what would work in classical logic, but we can still do it if we use topos theory because that allows us to get outside of what's going on in classical logic and gives us a really nice, easy to use kind of theory of continuous manifolds and so on. Um, another very interesting reason for studying topos theory is if you're interested in physics. I mean, more people, especially studying quantum mechanics, are realizing that like classical logic um, is not necessarily completely um, suitable for studying quantum mechanics and it's not sort of a priori clear that ideas like the real number kind of continuum is really something that's kind of physically relevant and so we want to search wider we want to search kind of outside of classical logic and outside of kind of classical set theory and classical theories of the continuum and topos theory is a great place to do that so there's lots of reasons. Also, if you're interested in things like computation, and another thing is the idea of homotopy type theory. It's like emerging as this kind of new foundation of mathematics, which is very nice because it's very suitable for things like computer assisted proofs. Um, but it's possible to understand what's going on in things like homotopy type theory a lot more easily if one is aware of the kind of underlying structure of topos theory i mean once one knows enough about sort of topos theory and the kind of surrounding category theory um, one can basically just um, get an explanation of what homotopy type theory is about in terms of category theory so it sort of acts as a um, stepping stone to be able to understand these things so there's lots of good reasons um, to understand about topos theory now as you can imagine with this thing being so expressive it's a rather challenging 
um, subject to talk about because there's so many results and everything's so sort of abstract because it has to be, because it has to be this kind of general language. And so I'd say that topos theory is a fairly challenging thing to learn about. And to be honest, it's also a fairly challenging thing to make a video like this about. Um, so I'd say that this first part is quite rigorous, okay? Uh, it's quite rigorous and the kind of, there's some relatively involved proofs and things like that. Um, this second part, less so. Um, I sometimes just quote results from other authors that I haven't necessarily gone through proofs of myself and so on. And um, yeah, and then this third part, even less so. It's more of a kind of rapid run through lots of different things. So um, it's worth bearing that in mind. Now, as I say, I do go through this first part where I'm really covering stuff from Colin McClarty um, in more detail and maybe even too much detail at some point for a sort of first viewing. And so as usual, I encourage you to watch this video on double speed and um, sort of bear with it because once you get to the third part, um, there's hopefully going to be some things in there which will really help a lot of this stuff to click into place, particularly when I start talking about this kind of partially ordered set uh, called sub X, which has objects as sub objects of X, and we can think of them as being kind of ordered by uh, containments, okay? So, yeah, that all been said. I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, stay tuned for this Mitchell Benabar language video that's coming soon because I think once we've got all this stuff in place, it's a really nice position to be at where one can um, develop understanding to a great degree using this kind of topos theory. Okay, so all the videos I've made over the last few months have been building to this point. We're going to look at the fascinating structure of toposes, how all these different kind of sub-objects of these different objects in these toposes are related, how these ideas of kind of generalized logic can be thought about in terms of toposes, how one can do general mathematics in a topos, how one can create these kind of languages where one can express lots of different things and talk about all these general structures, how all this stuff is related to all these different kind of spaces. I mean, topos theory is a playground in my opinion. It's, it's so interesting. There's so many different ideas all interacting with each other. So, this is going to be the agenda then. We're going to talk about the basic components of a topos and then we're going to get stuck into the really interesting theory about toposes. So we've already seen lots of examples over the last few videos of special kind of arrows and limits and co-limits um, and we've discussed exponential objects the only main kind of component left to discuss is a sub-object classifier. Now, I have done another video on topos theory. That was more of a kind of introductory video with lots of graphical examples. And it may help you to go through that video. Um, I don't think it's necessary because I'll try and keep this stuff... Um, I'll try and reintroduce everything, but I might be going a bit quicker in this video. So you can refer back to that if you want to. Um, right then, so let's jump right in. The main kind of category theory gadget that topos theory involves is what's called a sub-object classifier. So what is a sub-object classifier? Well, it's an object typically written as omega with an arrow into it from the terminal object, which is typically called true. So the easiest way to think about this idea is to think about the category of sets. And in the category of sets, we can think of omega as a set with two elements, true and false. And what is the role of this arrow T? 
Well, T stands for true. And in the category of sets, the terminal object is just a one element set. And this T arrow just picks out which of these two elements stands for true. OK, so it's pretty simple in the category of sets. We have these two elements. This one's called true. This one's called false. We know this one's called true because there's this arrow from the singleton set called T pointing into it. And this arrow plus this object omega constitutes this so-called sub-object classifier. OK, um, but what is a sub-object classifier in general? Well, in general, it's um, something like this, an object and an arrow from a terminal object, but it has to have a special property that it can classify sub-objects. So what does that mean? Well, let's have another look at this example in the category of sets, okay? So um, the idea is this. Suppose we have any monomorphism. So here's an example, this monomorphism M from A to B. So in the category of sets, this is just a one-to-one -one function, okay? Um, and you see that it is selecting a kind of sub-object of this object B here. In particular, we can think of this monomorphism as picking out these elements. So it's sort of specifying this subset of these three elements on the left. Um, and now what we can do is we can say, well, what about if we wanted to describe this kind of sub-object here of B, which is getting kind of picked out by this monomorphism into B? Could we do that with an arrow into omega, a so-called classifying arrow? And I'm denoting that classifying arrow as chi subscript m, okay? And the idea is that we're going to send the things which are in our sub-object to true and the thing that's not in our sub-object to false. Okay. So you do this kind of thing in computer science, for example. So say you had a spreadsheet of people and um, some of them were male and some of them were female and you wanted to record the kind of subset of people who are female, then you could say, have a column which says female question mark. And then for the people who are females, we put true. And for the people who are males, we put false. So that's what's called a kind of indicator function often. We're kind of describing this particular subset by sending the elements in our set to true if they belong to that subset or false if they do not belong to that subset. And this is just what a classifying arrow is in this category of sets. You see, it's just sending these arrows which are present in the kind of subset sweeped out by M. They get sent to the true entry of omega and this other element gets sent to the false entry. OK, um, however, we want to make this category theory, so we want to describe everything in terms of arrows. So what we really do is pick out this entry, which means true, with this arrow T like this, okay? So that's a little bit about what a sub-object classifier is in the category of sets. Now, let's just talk in generality for a bit, okay? Um, so I don't want to uh, give you the... Um, full definition of a sub-object classifier yet, um, I just want to build up a bit more background, okay? So in a general category, um, one thing I want to convince you of is that an arrow T that comes from a terminal object is always going to be a monomorphism, okay? Because this is going to be useful for us. So say we have a category with a terminal object, and we have some arrow, which we'll call T, which goes into some object omega. Now I want to convince you that that is a monomorphism. So say we have a couple of arrows that come first, X and Y from some W, let's say. And so in order for this to be a monomorphism, what we need is that T after X 
equals t after y implies x equals y. So is that true? And the answer is yes, that is true. Why is that true? Well, we don't even really need this to see this. X is always equal to Y. Why? Because this is a terminal object. The defining feature of a terminal object is that there's only one arrow into it from any object. So there's only one arrow into one from W. So X has to equal Y, okay? So yes, any arrow coming out of a terminal object is a monomorphism. OK, and so that's why in this diagram, I draw this kind of tail on the back of this arrow. This represents it's a monomorphism. OK, so the next kind of important fact is that when we do the pullback of a monomorphism, we get a monomorphism. OK, and so this is something I discussed in the last video on pullbacks, and it's a fairly important result as far as talking about sub-object classifiers goes. So, I mean, really, this is the basic idea of inverse images of sub-objects, okay? So it goes something like this. Um, when we have a pullback square, the way we get a pullback square is we start with some kind of a diagram two arrows pointing into the same object, and then we do a pullback of that kind of diagram. So think about this diagram drawn in white. When we do a pullback of that, we find this object with its arrows going into the bottom left and top right object. I encourage you to look at the previous video on pullbacks if this is not familiar to you. Basically, when we have a pullback square like this, sometimes we will call M the pullback of T along chi of M. OK, so this is just um, terminology, really. And it just means that we find the pullback of this white part of the picture here. And that's this red part of the picture. And then this arrow opposite T in the square is thought of as the pullback of T along this arrow chi M of the diagram here. When we have a monomorphism as we do here, and we do the pullback of it along an arrow, there's a very nice interpretation of that, which is that we can think of M here as the kind of inverse image of T along chi of M. So, the basic idea is we can think of T as a sub-object of omega, and then we can think of M as the kind of sub-object of B, consisting of the stuff that gets sent by chi of M to the sub-object T of omega. So let me illustrate what I mean in the category of sets. OK, so what I've done, I've taken this picture, I've marked the element of omega that represents true by putting a box around it. And I've just taken these sets here and rotated them um, 90 degrees counterclockwise. And um, we have this picture here. So the way we can think about this is we have this function chi of m, um, which is this function from b to omega. And sometimes we might call this kind of thing a classifying arrow because it is essentially classifying this sub-object M of B, OK? Now, the way it's doing this is it's sending the elements which are present in this sub-object to true and the element which is absent is getting sent to false. But the idea is that if we have a look at this sub-object of omega, which is called true, okay, this one which is picked out by this arrow from the terminal object. Well, if we find the inverse image of that sub-object along chi of m, then we get this sub-object m. In other words, this sub-object m basically consists of the stuff which gets sent to true under chi of m. 
So in this case, this subobject t of omega is pretty simple. It's just an arrow into omega from the terminal object. But this same basic idea of inverse images works more generally, okay? So in the general case, we can have some subobjects of omega, some arrow into omega, and then we can think, well, what if we take the pullback of that subobject along this green arrow? And that'll give us a subobject of B that we could consider to be the inverse image of this subobject of omega along this arrow that we're kind of pulling back along, this green arrow. Okay. So, okay, that's, I think that's enough background. Now let's get on to a proper definition of what a subobject classifier is. So we'll suppose we're working in a general category that has a terminal object, okay? So a subobject classifier is an object omega with an arrow from the terminal object one to omega, an arrow called T. And this T stands for true, okay? So this arrow from the terminal object to omega represents the kind of part of omega that represents true in some sense. The, okay, but the important thing is that we want this object omega and this arrow t to have a special universal property, okay? Firstly, we want, we want, the, we want them to be such that for every monomorphism m from any object a to an object b, we want there to exist a unique arrow chi of m from b to omega which is such that we have the following pullback square okay in other words which is such that m is the pullback of t along chi of m that's the definition of a subobject classifier we want it to we have this arrow t from a terminal object into omega and we want it such that for any monomorphism m there's a unique arrow chi of m from the target of the monomorphism to omega such that pulling back this truth arrow along chi of m gives us this monomorphism m okay that's the definition and you see this is just what's going on in the category of sets in our example we've picked out this truth element we've picked out this subobject of omega in such a way that given any other kind of monomorphism going on in the category of sets there's a classifying arrow coming from the target of that monomorphism into omega such that if we pull true back along that classifying arrow we get our sub object. So just a little note about notation. I think in my previous video, I was calling um, this classifying arrow phi of m. But I wanna call it chi of m now. That's more concurrent with most of the literature. And sometimes people call this kind of chi of m a characteristic arrow of a monomorphism. Okay, so when you're trying to understand the idea of subobject classifier, um, I think the hardest part to understand is, is this last bit, okay? So let's just have another look at the definition. We're saying that, okay, we have this object and we have this arrow from a terminal object, we understand that. And it's such that for every monic, there exists this unique arrow from the target of that monic into omega, which is such that there's some special property um, occurring, okay? Um, but what is this property? Well, it has to do with pullbacks and different things. And pullbacks are a relatively abstract kind of uh, thing. And so this is something that some people uh, get stuck on. But that's okay because there's an equivalent um, thing that we can say instead of this stuff that I put in green brackets. And that is this stuff that I'm writing in yellow here, okay? 
And so we can replace this yellow text with this stuff in green brackets. And this just says, for any arrow h, uh, and this just says, for any arrow little h, from some object h to b, we have that h is in m, if and only if chi m of h is true after this unique arrow from capital H to the terminal object. So this is a lot easier to understand once you draw it out. So for example, let's just take this capital H to be the terminal object, just for an example. And then let's say little h is picking this element in our example in sets. So we want that this little h is going to be in M, and that just means that there exists a unique arrow k such that h equals M after k. That's what this means. Um, we want this to happen if and only if doing chi of m after h is equal to true after exclamation mark h. Well, what's this true after exclamation mark h mean? Well, exclamation mark h is just the, it's just a notation, meaning the arrow from h to the terminal object. And so we can think of t after exclamation mark h as just the arrow that sends everything in h to true, okay? Um, and so what we're basically saying is that we want H to be in this monomorphism M if and only if this classifying arrow of a monomorphism composed with H sends everything to true. OK, so basically we just want um, this kind of classifying arrow to have the feature that given any arrow into B, Composing that arrow with chi of m sends everything to true if and only if that arrow from h here is in our monic that chi of m should be the classifying arrow of. So this kind of definition is actually quite a lot easier to use in practice. Okay, um, so we can sort of rephrase the definition of a subobject classifier if we like to say a subobject classifier is an object omega with an arrow t from a terminal object to omega um, which is such that for any monomorphism m from an object a to an object b there exists a unique arrow chi of m called the classifying arrow of m which goes from b to omega and is such that for any arrow little h that goes into b, we have that h is in m if and only if chi of m after h is equal to true after the arrow from the source of this little h to the terminal object. And here, when I write h in m, that's just shorthand. for saying that there exists a K such that H is equal to M after K. But anyway, how do we know that it's OK um, to swap out this definition in terms of pullbacks for this definition of like arrows being in our monomorphism M? Well, the reason is because I showed in the last video on pullbacks um, that there is this kind of arrow centric way of talking about inverse images, which is sort of where this comes from. So to be more precise, um, this thing that I put in green brackets here is just saying that we have this kind of pullback square formed. And another way to say this is that M is the pullback of T along chi of M. And another way to say this 
is that m is equal to chi m to the minus 1 of t. In other words, m is equal to the pullback of t along chi of m, or m is equal to the inverse image of t along chi of m. Well, the thing is, though, we're going to use this interesting kind of result, which I proved in the last video. And basically what it says is that when we have a monomorphism, like this one here, t from 1 to omega, and we have this arrow chi of m, which is going into the kind of target of our monomorphism. Well, what this result says is that the inverse image of that monomorphism t along chi of m, in other words, this monomorphism chi of m to the minus 1 of t, this is really characterized by the feature that for any arrow h, we have that h is in chi of m to the minus 1 of t, if and only if chi of m after h is in t. All right, so you can see a proof to this kind of idea in my last video. In fact, also in my previous video on Topos theory, um, I talk about this kind of connection and I also went through a proof of this with more kind of direct focus on subobject classifiers as is relevant here uh, within the video which was attached in the description. So anyway, basically what I'm trying to say is that previous results established that this monomorphism M is going to be equivalent to chi m to the minus 1 of t, if and only if we have the feature that h is going to be in m, if and only if doing chi m of h gives something in t. So in other words, h is in m, if and only if chi m of h is something in t. So I claim that this last bit, that this is equal to t after exclamation mark h, I claim that this is equivalent to saying that chi m after h is in t. Why is that? Well, firstly, these brackets don't matter. We can just ignore those. And secondly, this just says that chi m after h is in t. What does it mean for chi m after h to be in t? Well, it means that there has to be an arrow from the kind of source of this chi m after h. In other words, there has to be an arrow from capital H into the source of this t here, which is a terminal object, which is such that if we do t after such an arrow, um, then we get chi of m after h. In other words, there exists an L such that chi m after h equals t after l. So somehow composing these is equivalent to doing t after some arrow l, which must come from capital H to 1. But there's only one arrow that does come from capital H to 1. And so if this does work, then the only way it can work is if l is equal to exclamation mark h. And therefore, saying that chi of m after h is in t is equivalent to saying that chi of m after h is t after exclamation mark h. Okay, so that's where this comes from. Basically, saying, saying this is equivalent to saying that m is the pullback of t along chi of m, which is equivalent to saying that m is equal to chi of m to the minus 1 of t, which satisfies this formula always. In fact, we can consider the kind of pullback of t along chi of m to really be defined by this formula. Um, and just writing this with chi m to the minus 1 of t is equal to m uh, basically gives us this statement here. So we can substitute in this for this and we can get this perhaps easier to work with uh, way of thinking about what a sub-object classifier is. 
So I think that just about does it for introducing the kind of essence of the sub-object classifier. Um, there's just one other thing to say, which is um, what about uniqueness, okay? So let's say we have a category and we're lucky enough that it has a sub-object classifier. I mean, that's amazing because it means that we can do logic and think about truth and understand the parts of objects and do lots of fascinating things. But um, if we find one, do we know that it's unique? Do we know that, how do we know that there can't be many kind of different looking sub-object classifiers? Well, we do know that. There, there is a result which basically says that if we have two sub-object classifiers, then there's going to be an isomorphism between them in a kind of nice way. And we've seen this kind of um, idea crop up many times with these different universal constructions. Indeed, one can think of a sub-object classifier um, as having another kind of universal construction. Um, anyway, I do prove that the sub-object classifier is unique up to isomorphism, if it exists. I proved that in the, in the video on proofs, which is added in the description of my previous video on topos theory. Topos theory, and so, which was called category theory for beginners, topos theory and subobjects. Okay, so now we know about subobject classifiers, which are also known as truth valued objects. So now we know about all these things, we can define what a topos is. Now, all of the toposes I'll talk about are so called elementary toposes. There's another more kind of involved notion called Grothendieck toposes, which I'm not going to discuss. Um, I just want to talk about so called elementary toposes. I won't bother using this word elementary, I'll just say toposes, okay? So, what is a topos? Well, it's a category E that has special properties. Now, um, there's various different ways to define what a topos is, various different equivalent definitions, um, because there's so much structure in a topos, different authors pick out different things and they say, well, if a category has this, that and the other, then it's a topos, okay? Um, and so there's many kind of equivalent ways of defining what a topos is, depending on which features you pick out. The basic idea is you pick out a few important features that are necessary and sufficient to define all the other features that a topos has. Okay, um, so this isn't the shortest way to define what an elementary topos is, but it's an equivalent definition. And it goes like this. A category E is an elementary topos if and only if it has all finite limits, all finite co-limits, all exponential objects, so that means it has an exponential object for any ordered pair of objects, okay? Um, and also it has a sub-object classifier. Right, so do we know what all of this stuff means? Um, what's it mean for a category to have all finite limits? That means for any finite kind of index category, if there's a functor from that into our category E, then we can find a limit of that functor. Um, a more kind of down to earth way to say this, um, to say that our category has all finite limits, is to say that our category has terminal objects and it has a pullback for every pair of objects, okay? Because with terminal objects and pullbacks, we can get products and equalizers and using products and equalizers, we can construct any finite limits. Um, dually, having all finite co-limits um, is equivalent to saying that our category has initial objects and a push out uh, for every pair of objects, okay? What do I mean when I say we have all exponential objects? Well, I mean, um, we have this object b to the power of a for any a and b and the associated evaluation function as well. And of course, we've just seen what it means to have um, this kind of sub-object classifier. So this is the definition of an elementary topos. Now, why? 
why does all this stuff, um, why do we want all this stuff to be present in our category? Well, we've already seen, um, well, basically, I mean, this is a bit rough because you can do so many things with Topos theory. It's difficult to, um, it's difficult to explain why all this stuff has a part to play, but very roughly. So just to say quickly then, the real great thing that we get out of having all finite limits is to have a terminal object, which we need to define our subobject classifier, and also to have all pullbacks, okay? Because this gives us a way to interpret any arrow into Omega um, in terms of subobjects. So let me explain what I mean. Suppose we have any arrow y from an object b into omega. Well, if we have all these pullbacks, then we can always pull back this true arrow along y. And this gives us a monomorph and this gives us a subobject of b, which we could call y to the minus one of t. So we could call this the pullback of true along y, or we could call this the inverse image of true along y. And the thing to notice is that this is going to be a subobject of B, and the classifying arrow of this is going to be y. Okay, so what we are basically doing, it's not just for any monomorphism we can find a classifying arrow. When we have all these finite limits, for any arrow into omega we can think of that as a classifying arrow and we can find monomorphisms which that could be considered a classifying arrow of for example this one here now in fact um, this kind of inverse image monomorphism thing here really is only really defined up to equivalence but that's fine as we shall see so basically having finite limits and having a subobject classifier allows us to do this kind of two-way correspondence. Given a monomorphism, we can find a classifying arrow by the definition of a subobject classifier. And given a classifying arrow, we can always pull back true along that classifying arrow to give a kind of corresponding monomorphism or subobject of the source of our arrow into omega. OK, um, so having finite limits is great. It's also nice to have finite co-limits. Now, the reason we want exponential objects is interesting. So there's a lot to exponential objects, um, but sort of roughly speaking, what an exponential object b to the power of a gives us is it basically acts like a kind of internal representation of the collection of arrows from a to b. Now, the thing that I've been trying to argue here is that arrows from B to Omega correspond to subobjects of B. OK, so if we have an arrow Y from B to Omega, we can think of that as the classifying arrow of a subobject M, where this is M. So an arrow from B to Omega corresponds to a subobject of B in a topos. And so, and that means it's very interesting to write Omega to the power of B. This is an exponential object. And this acts like a kind of internal representation of the arrows from B to Omega. And what, do, and what does an arrow from B to Omega correspond with? It corresponds to a subobject of B. Okay, so think about in set theory, um, you have what's called the power set of a set, which is the set of all subsets. Okay, um, so for example, if you have a set um, of one and two, then you can think of all the subsets. So there's the empty set, there's the set that just contains one, there's the set that just contains two, and there's a set that contains both of them. 
Okay, so there's these four different subsets of um, this set of one and two. And so together, that collection of subsets, we can think of it as the power set. And in a similar way, this is called the power object of B because it represents kind of internally within the category, the collection of all of the sub objects of B. So this is really an extremely fascinating idea. I mean, um, for example, you can have a topos of graphs, this category of graphs I keep talking about, um, and you can have a kind of, for a particular graph, there's another kind of power object of that, which is a graph that represents all of the kind of subgraphs of that graph. Um, just like we can have a set that represents the collection of subsets of a given set, we can have a graph that represents the collection of subgraphs of a given graph. And one can really um, think about some very, very interesting concepts in terms of these kind of power objects. And it's really a very nice organizing principle. So being able to get power objects is one of the main reasons that we want a top loss to have exponential objects. So just to reiterate, the main point I want to get across is simply that a top loss is a category E which has all finite limits, finite cone limits, exponential objects, and a subobject classifier. What, so, okay, why do we want to have all these features? What, what's the basic thing that we're trying to do? Well, essentially what we're really trying to get at is a kind of framework where we can do mathematics. So we know we can do mathematics in set theory. And a lot of the time when we're doing mathematics, we're using logic. So we're using ideas like things being true or false. We're using words like and and or and not and implies. And these have definite kinds of um, meanings. And they also are kind of backed up by set theory. OK, so, for example, when we say um, this statement's true and that statement's true, we're sort of talking about something corresponding to the intersection of two sets, okay? And um, basically, we want to be able to do this kind of stuff, but for much more general structures. And we also want to talk about more general kinds of logic. Logic where things are not simply either true or false, kind of intuitionistic logic, which is like a kind of generalization of classical logic. And just like classical logic is backed up by set theory, we want to think about structures um, living in toposes, not just this topos, which is the category of sets, but more general kinds of toposes. We want to think about these kind of structures, like maybe graphs or dynamical systems, and see how they are living with different kinds of logic. Essentially, what we want to do is understand what kinds of logic there are in other kinds of universes. This is really, um, for me at least, one of the main appeals of topos theory. Um, but also we'll see that the kind of logic, the kind of um, reasoning that we can do in these elementary toposes is actually very pure. Um, essentially, we sort of take the classical logic which we have and remove a few assumptions, which in some cases are a bit suspicious anyway. And um, we're left with this kind of very nice pure logic, which applies to every kind of topos. So even from a purely kind of logical standpoint, it's very worth doing. But also, if you're interested in things like geometry and shapes and structures, it's also very interesting because this kind of logic that we're going to um, be, because this kind of logic that we're going to see emerge from topos theory is all kind of backed up by connections with structures. Okay, So one of the um, nicest examples of a topos is that for a category C, we have that this category set to the power of C. This category of functors from C to set is a topos. Okay, so choosing different categories C, we get lots of different examples of interesting toposes. Um, for example, we can have the 
category of graphs, that's a topos. The category of dynamical systems is a topos. The category of functions is a topos. There's many interesting examples. Um, and so it's very nice to be able to actually apply all of this kind of um, theory to these practical cases and see what kind of structures all of this interesting logic corresponds to in concrete cases. Okay, so there's so many interesting uses for sub-object classifiers. And one of the most kind of elementary, but still pretty important, is to really get more understanding about what it means for two sub-objects to be equivalent. I mean, um, it's very important in mathematics when you're studying certain objects to understand, hopefully in many ways, what it means for them to be equivalent. Because being able to see when things are equivalent really helps you to understand the kind of essence of what things are. And we're especially interested in these monomorphisms, these sub-objects in topos theory. And so it's very important to understand what it means to write that one sub-object of X, A, is equivalent to another sub-object of X, B. So before I get into the details, let me just do this kind of illustrative example, okay? So this is happening in the category of sets. We have our sub-object classifier here, omega, and we think of that consisting of these two elements, true and false. So this um, true element here, we can think of as being pointed out by an arrow from the terminal object, if we like. Okay, um, so now let's suppose we have this object X here. Let's say it's for sets with one, two, and three. And we have this arrow drawn in green, uh, this function that I'll call chi of A, which is sending one and two to true and three to false. Now we can ask, um, is there a sub-object of X that this green arrow chi of A classifies? So in other words, what we're asking is, what is the pullback of true along chi of A? And um, essentially what this boils down to is saying that we're really just looking for any kind of monomorphism into X that has a classifying arrow, which is chi of A. And so, for example, the obvious choice is this inclusion function A here. So we just look at which elements are sent to true under chi of A, and then we say, okay, let's just put those together in this set A. And that's fine. And that's um, a worthy kind of solution to this problem. We found this sub-object of X, um, which we're calling little a, which has chi of a as its classifying arrow. Um, however, the thing is, that's not the only solution to this problem. Here's another monomorphism into this set X, this one from this set B. And this set has two elements that we're calling Tim and Joe. And we send Tim to one and Joe to two. And you see that this kind of sub-object of X is essentially equivalent to this one um, A here, but it's not the same because we're calling these elements different things. So we have these two kind of different but equivalent sub-objects and we see that either one of them can be considered to be the sub-object of X, which is classified by this arrow chi of A. So let's just make sure we understand what's going on here. The definition of a sub-object classifier tells us that given any monomorphism, let's say little a, that goes into some object x, we ought to be able to find a unique classifying arrow, a unique arrow like this chi of a that goes from x to omega with the property that we can obtain our original monomorphism A as being the pullback of true along this chi of A. So given a monomorphism, this classifying arrow better be uniquely determined. But on the other hand, just given an arrow from some x to omega, such as this chi of A here, there may be many monomorphisms 
um, which are coming into X, which have this chi of A as their classifying arrow. But the thing is that all of these monomorphisms are equivalent. You see, this monomorphism and this one are basically equivalent. I mean, when we're taking this view from sort of this category theory a standpoint, in a sense, we're sort of so far zoomed away from this category of sets that we don't really care how these elements are labelled. We just look at things kind of up to isomorphism. And up to isomorphism, these two objects look the same. And these two kind of, and these two monomorphisms into X look the same. They are equivalent monomorphisms. Okay, so this is a concept which we've encountered before. And we've defined, um, this was in the video on special arrows, we defined two monomorphisms into X, A and B, to be equivalent if and only if A is contained in B and B is contained in A. When I say A is contained in B, what I mean is that there exists an arrow K such that A equals B after K. And when I say B is contained in A, what I mean is that there exists an arrow L such that B equals A after L. And in that video on special arrows, we also obtain this other um, probably more useful um, equivalent way to say that these monomorphisms A and B are equivalent to each other. And that is this kind of arrow centric way of stating it. And what this is saying is that these monomorphisms A and B with the same target are going to be equivalent if and only if they have the same arrows in them. So in other words, for any arrow H, from any object capital H to X, we have that H is in A, if and only if H is in B. Okay, so that's a really nice way of saying that two subobjects are equivalent. And um, now we know about subobject classifiers, we can have yet another way to say when two subobjects are equivalent. So the new result I want to get across is that a and B are going to be equivalent if and only if they have the same classifying arrow. So it's fairly easy to see this if we just kind of recall one of our two equivalent ways to define what a subobject classifier is. You see, at the start of the video, I defined a subobject classifier in terms of pullbacks, but then I also said, well, if you don't want to think about pullbacks, there's this equivalent way to define a subobject classifier in terms of arrows being in monomorphisms. And that second way, let me just repeat, basically a subobject classifier is an object omega with an arrow T um, from the terminal object to omega, which has the property that for any monomorphism, in our case, say from capital A to X for any more monomorphism little a, we have that there exists a unique arrow, chi of A, from X to omega, which has the property that for any arrow little h, from any object capital H to X, we have that H is in A if and only if chi of A after H is equal to true after exclamation mark H. And so now by looking at, and so now by looking at this and this, we can see why this statement here is equivalent to this statement here, because we know that chi of a just sort of, so we, because we know that this arrow chi of a is the unique arrow such that for every h, we have h is in a, if and only if chi a after h sends everything to true. So the thing is then, that if indeed these two subobjects A and B 
of x are equivalent, in other words, if we do have that a is equivalent to b, then we're going to have this statement here, that h is going to be in a if and only if h is in b. And so for any of these arrows h into x, we're going to have, in this case, we're going to have h is in a if and only if h is in b. And then according to the definition of chi b, this is going to be if and only if chi b after h is equal to true after exclamation mark h. So we see that in this case where a and b are equivalent subobjects of x, these monomorphisms A and B have to have the same classifying arrow. So essentially we've shown that this implies this. Now can we go the other way around? What if we have that chi of A is equal to chi of B? Well in this case where we have this we're going to have that for any h, chi a after h is equal to chi b after h. And according to the sort of way that the classifying arrows chi work, this is going to happen if and only if h is in b. And so in this case, again, we're going to have that H is going to be in A if and only if H is in B. So this statement here implies this statement here, which is equivalent saying that A and B are equivalent monomorphisms. So yes, we basically have this new way to say when two subobjects of X are equivalent. They're equivalent precisely when they have the same classifying arrows. And this is very nice because it gives us a very kind of concrete way to think about when two subobjects are equivalent and also um, to kind of pick out things to represent um, these different types of subobjects because we can just sort of associate every family of equivalent subobjects of X with a particular arrow from X to Omega, that being their common classifying arrow. Okay, so now I want to prove a nice fact about top osses, which is this kind of fact that holds in the category of sets, um, which in the category of sets is well known, which is that an arrow is going to be an isomorphism if and only if it's a monomorphism and an epimorphism. So this is a very kind of familiar result to us because we're used to doing set theory where a function is a bijection if and only if it's one to one and onto and it's very nice that there's an analogy of this that holds in any topos which is that an arrow is iso if and only if it's monic and epic but how do we prove this well to prove this result let's ask ourselves an interesting question which is how can we think of a subset as a solution to an equation. Hmm. Well, how about this? Um, if you have a set, you could be sending some of the elements in that set to true and other elements in that set to false. So let's have that as our first function, the kind of classifying arrow of the subset that we want to pick out. And for our other function, let's just send everything in our set to true. So we have this first function that only sends the things to true that we want in our subset. And we have this second function that sends everything to true. And so if we then um, find the equalizer of these two functions, in other words, if we find the collection of elements in our first set that get acted on the same way by both of these functions, that will literally be the subset that we're interested in classifying, okay? And so what we see is that 
we can think of this kind of monomorphism, which is picking out our subsets, as an equaliser of two different functions. So we can see that in the category of sets, and indeed a similar kind of result happens in any topos. Okay, so the reason that this result, um, which is that an arrow in a topos is iso if and only if it's monic and epic, the reason that holds true is uh, because of a more basic fact, which is that every monomorphism, every monic in a topos, for example, this one M from A to B, is an equalizer. This is an equalizer of some arrows. And I'm going to describe what those arrows are. Let me describe how this works. So firstly, let's just recall again this definition of a subobject classifier. Um, I, I keep using this sort of arrow centric definition rather than the pullback based one. They're equivalent, but I think this one's usually easier to think about. So um, subobject classifier is an object omega with an arrow t from the terminal object into it, such that for any monomorphism M from A to B, there exists a unique classifying arrow, chi of M, from B to omega, which is such that for any arrow little h that goes into B, we have that h is in M if and only if chi M after h sends everything to true. So I should say there exists this unique chi which is such that all this stuff holds true. There's just one chi that makes all this work, okay? Um, so, okay, let's say we have a monomorphism M, and then we have this classifying arrow here, chi of M. And so we know that chi of M is such that when we compose it with any little h, any arrow little h going into b, um, we're going to have that that composition sends everything in h to true, in this sense, if and only if h is in this monic m. So another way we can write this, this right hand side here, um, which is T exclamation mark H, basically this arrow that sends everything in capital H to true. Um, another way we can write this is as T after exclamation mark B, after little h, okay? Because exclamation mark B is the unique arrow from B to the terminal object. And doing exclamation mark B after h will give us the unique arrow from h to the terminal object, which is exclamation mark h, okay? So this composed with this gives this, and so this equals this. So another way we can say this stuff is to say that this arrow little h is gonna be an m if and only if chi of m after h is equal to t after exclamation mark b after h. OK. And so now we recall another way to think about what a monomorphism is. Um, I discussed this in my video on elementary machinery in category theory, uh, where I discussed a lot about um, equalizers and products and things. And um, one of the results that we got is this other way to think about what an equalizer is. We can think of an equalizer of two arrows, like this lower arrow and upper arrow here, as a subobject of B. In particular, a subobject of B such that any arrow, so we can think of the equalizer, let's, um, I'll draw it as um, a monomorphism E going into B, and it has a special property that for any arrow H, going into B, we have that H is in this equalizer E, if and only if doing this arrow after H gives the same results as doing this arrow after H. So it's this kind of 
our own membership based way of defining what an equalizer is. And so um, now knowing that, uh, we see that actually this equalizer here um, of these two arrows is in fact precisely M, okay? Because looking at this statement in purple, we now notice that this M, this general monomorphism in our topos, yes, it's a monomorphism, and also it has the property that any arrow little h is going to be in M if and only if chi of M after H is equal to T after exclamation mark B after H. And so essentially then this arrow little H is going to be in M if and only if H equalizes chi of M and T after exclamation mark B. So, um, because, so because M is a monomorphism and because it's the kind of condition for an arrow to be a member of this monomorphism, this subobject, is exactly that it equalizes these two um, arrows here. Um, that means by one of the results which we've previously obtained that indeed M is just the equalizer of T after exclamation mark B and chi of M. And if you think about um, my kind of analogy at the beginning about how we can think of a set as a solution, this is basically just the same kind of idea, just happening in a general topos. So, okay, how does this help us to make our central claim? Well, another result that we obtained in that video on elementary machinery was that an equalizer is epic if and only if it is an isomorphism, okay? So now we know that every monomorphism is an equalizer. We know that um, we know that if we have a monomorphism that's also epic, then that's going to be an equalizer that's also epic. And therefore, this result will imply that it's an isomorphism. And of course, every isomorphism is monic and epic. OK, so now we reach one of the most fascinating points in topos theory, where we start seeing this kind of generalized topos logic. OK, so now we're going to understand what this word and means. So, for example, when I say my book is about maths and my book is very interesting. Um, what does the word and mean in that sentence? Well, essentially, you could say it means that both of those statements are true. OK, this book is about maths and this book is very interesting. Um, but you could also think of it as a kind of statement in something like set theory. OK, you could say that it means that this book belongs to the set of things about maths and it belongs to the set of things that are interesting. It belongs to the intersection of things about maths and things that are interesting. And you see that using kind of indicator functions or classifying arrows, these two kind of ways of looking at things are interchangeable. OK, um, you could say that the kind of classifying arrow, which is classifying things which are about maths, sends this to true. And the classifying arrow, which is classifying things that are interesting, sends this to true. OK, um, so there's really this kind of interplay between set theoretic ideas, like the idea of the intersection of two subsets and kind of logical ideas. And they're really interrelated by the idea of these kind of classifying arrows. And so this subobject classifier, and so this subobject classifier is really kind of like acting something like a kind of warp gate that allows us to go in between the kind of language of subobjects and the language of logic. Okay, so this is going to become more clear as I go along. Let me just start to unpack 
this idea of how we can talk about the word and in general topos theory because it's uh, I think it's a very interesting idea and once I've unpacked it we can look at an example in the category of sets and really see exactly what's going on so basically what we're going to do is we're going to say well suppose we've got a couple of sub objects a and b of x and we want to calculate their intersection so what is the intersection of these two sub objects well this is a notion which we've encountered before and we've seen that there's a couple of equivalent ways to talk about the intersection of these two monics so we call the intersection of these two monics a intersection b we could think of it emanating from an object which we'll call a cap b one way we can think of this arrow a cap b the way i introduced it is to say well if we have this kind of corner like this and then we take a pullback of this diagram like this then if we get this diagonal say a after p1 then we could rightly think of that as being the intersection of a and b and then maybe we'd want to call this object involved in this pullback a cap b so that's the way i introduced the sort of notion of the intersection of two monics uh, but there's an equivalent way to talk about the intersection of two monics which i actually find preferable and that is just to say that this monic a cap b little a cap little b this intersection of these two um we can really think of it as being defined as having the property that for any arrow h into x we have that h is in a cap b if and only if h is in a and h is in b so these are two equivalent ways of talking about the intersection of two monics um, I do prefer this one. I like it because it matches up better with our usual kind of intuition of the idea of the intersection of two subsets. And also because it talks about this sort of general notion of um, when arrows are in monics. Of course, this has to hold for any arrow H into X. Um, and in that sense, it, it sort of... Um, takes this idea of the intersection of monics right down to this most basic language of when arrows are in monics and this is a kind of language which you can often reduce monics to and you can compare them and see how they interact with each other at this kind of level so it's almost a bit like expanding out brackets in quadratic equations and things like that it brings everything down to a kind of common language so anyway, now we're going to ask ourselves a question, which is, can we get at this kind of monic, or at least something equivalent to it, using this idea of sub-object classifiers? Because, I mean, it seems as though A cap B, if it's truly the intersection of these sub-objects A and B of X, then it seems as though we ought to be able to get it using some kind of a notion of and okay because naively like if it, if this was happening in the category of sets you would probably say that um an element ought to be in a intersection b if and only if it's in a and it's in b so in other words you probably want the classifying arrow of this sub-object here to think, send things to true when the classifying arrow of little a sends the thing to true and the classifying arrow of little b sends that thing to true okay 
So that gives us something to think about. Right, so firstly, how about we ask ourselves, how does this idea of and work logically in the category of sets, okay? So, in the category of sets, of course, we know that omega looks like this. It has two elements, true and false. And so you can have a statement and it can be true or false, but and is about two statements. OK, so you've really got a pair of statements. So let's consider the product of omega with omega. OK, so I'll have another copy of omega here. So what we really want to do is see how two statements interact. So if we have two statements and each of them are either true or false, then together we're going to have an element in this set here, which we can think of as the product of omega with omega, okay? So I've just calculated the kind of Cartesian product of these two sets. So here we have omega times omega in the category of sets. Now, if we have two kind of points of omega, in other words, two basic things that can either be true or false, then what values are they allowed to take? So, okay, let's just do a little thought experiment. Uh, let's consider some simple statements um, which are either true or false, okay? And let's suppose we've got two of them. So we've got statement, let's say statement P, and let's say P is true. And then let's say we have another statement Q. And uh, I'm not going to make it too clear, but let's just say Q is either um, true or false. I'm not going to draw it in properly, but let's just say it's either true or false, okay? So now when is P and Q going to be true? Well, if P is true and Q is false, then P and Q is false, okay? Um, the only way that P and Q is going to be true is if P is true and Q is true. We write and like this. So we can say P and Q is going to be true if and only if P equals true and Q equals true. And that's going to happen if and only if p comma q is true comma true and we can think of this as an arrow from one to omega times omega okay so essentially we can think of if we have these two arrows, uh, an arrow P from one to omega and an arrow Q from one to omega, we can kind of combine them together and think of them as picking out a pair uh, from omega times omega. And the only way that doing and on P and Q is going to give us true is if we send um, is if we send both of these arrows to T comma T. like this. So what this is telling us is that there's something special about this point, t comma t. So in particular, what this is telling us is that if we define an arrow, I mean, it's going to be a monomorphism. And if we define this arrow that goes from our singleton set, which is a terminal object, and it goes into this t comma t point. Then this is going to be very useful for us because we're going to be able to find out that the and statements 
um, of some kind of pair of arrows that are going into omega times omega to compare them um, is going to end up being true uh, operating on those things if and only if those things are landing in this t comma t monic okay so okay let's say we have these two basic statements then p and q either of which can either be true or false and so we pair them together and consider them as an arrow into omega times omega and this is happening in the category of sets okay and we're really interested in when is p and q true when are they both true and so that's really going to happen when this arrow from one into omega times omega is actually equal to t comma t or another way to say it is that's going to happen when this arrow p comma q is in this subobject t comma t of omega times omega okay um and so really we can think of this as a sort of subobject of omega times omega which is sort of describing which pairs of truth values are going to return true when we do and upon them okay so it's easier if I just go through an example, okay? So basically, this is an arrow from a terminal object into omega times omega, this t comma t. So it's a subobject of omega times omega. So, so it has a classifying arrow. So what is that classifying arrow? Well, it's going to send t t to true, and it's going to send the other values to false. So, okay, what's a good name for this orange function here? Well, the most literal name would be chi of t comma t. This is literally the classifying arrow of this monic t comma t. But there's also another very good name for this orange arrow here, which is and, okay? I claim this is how we should define and. Now, why is that? Well, I know normally people like to say P and Q. Okay, so this and, if we're using this kind of symbol to represent and, then the and goes between the P and the Q. But um, in category theory, rather than using this kind of infix notation, we often prefer this kind of um, prefix notation. So for us, we may wish to prefer, we may prefer to write this as and operating on P and Q. So if we then define this as and, we see that this makes a very lot of sense because what we're going to have, I mean, what we basically have is um, we're going to have the chi of t comma t operating on p comma q is going to send everything to true so we could say this is t after exclamation mark h where in our case h is one okay but i just want to be a bit more general um and this is going to happen if and only if P comma Q is in T comma T. And the thing is that I think that this, to say P comma Q is in T comma T, is a really great sort of way to define when it's hap when P and Q are both true. Okay, so I'm saying in general, when we have a couple of arrows from some object H into omega, um, we can think of those really as sort of truth statements and I'd say that they're both true when if we pair these two arrows P and Q together we get something that's in T comma T so okay I was trying to give some kind of motivation for why we define all these and operations like this but um, I think it's probably best if I just go through the formal kind of definition of how we talk about and and intersection in terms of topos theory 
and then once we have all the kind of formal machinery we can go back and look again at the kind of set theoretic case and it will be more clear about all the details of things so basically here's the point we know that t is an arrow from the terminal object to omega and so t comma t can be considered an arrow from the terminal object to omega times omega this is an arrow from the terminal object so it can be considered a sub object of omega times omega so it must have a classifying arrow which is an arrow from omega times omega to omega which we can call what well, we can call it the classifying arrow of t comma t but we also want to give it another name we want to call it and so one way we can think of this is that and is the arrow such that t comma t is the pullback of t along and anyway how do we use this arrow this and arrow to calculate intersections well let's say we have a sub object a of x and a sub object b of x well these are each going to have classifying arrows so for this sub object a of x we'll have a classifying arrow chi of a that'll be an arrow from x to omega similarly we'll have chi of b from x to omega so okay now let's think about how to construct the intersection of these two sub objects a and b of x so since a is a sub object of x it's going to have a classifying arrow chi of a that's going to go from x to omega similarly this sub object b is going to have a classifying arrow chi of b from x to omega so we have chi of a from x to omega and we have chi of b from x to omega so what we can do is pair those two arrows together and that will give us an arrow like this that we can call chi of a comma chi of b and now here's the really interesting bit it turns out that if we do and after chi of a comma chi of b then that is going to give us an arrow from x to omega and that arrow is actually going to be the classifying arrow of a intersection b so this is really quite remarkable because it allows us to kind of logically combine um, these sub objects a and b and then if we just sort of do a pullback of true along the right kind of arrow that we've made we can pretty much mechanically create this a intersection b sub object here so the central claim basically is that the classifying arrow of a cap b is equal to and after the classifying arrow of a comma the classifying arrow of b and some authors prefer to sort of rewrite this in a kind of technically incorrect but more um, intuitively appealing form which is like this chi of a and chi of b and if you think about what this is saying it makes a lot of sense right think about what this means in the category of sets so chi of a cap b is this kind of classifying arrow of the intersection of a and b so it, we can think of it as a kind of function that sends if it's in the intersection of a and b otherwise it sends it to false okay that's what this looks like in the category of sets and also this would be the classifying arrow of a and this would be the classifying arrow of b and so what we'd be saying 
is that it's true that something is in A intersection B precisely when it's true that that thing is in A and it's true that that thing is in B. So the thing is though, people do like to write this with this kind of and shifted into the middle, but we can really just think of this as something like shorthand um, for this, because this is really what's going on in terms of category theory. We make this kind of pair arrow from X to omega times omega, and then we compose this kind of what we're calling the and arrow, which again is really just a special symbol for the classifying arrow of t comma t. So I'm about to illustrate how this works in the category of sets. And once you've seen a fully worked example, it becomes a lot easier to understand this. But since we're already here, I figure I might as well just prove this result because we're so close to proving it. So how can we prove this result? Well, in general, let's just remember that we can really characterize A cap B as being a subobject of X, which has this property that for any arrow, H into X, we have that H is in A cap B, if and only if H is in A and H is in B. So, okay, I have discussed this and concept a bit in my previous video on topos theory, um, but I don't think I've gone through the details of why it works properly as I'm doing now. Now, I am going to go through um, an example using set theory uh, more step by step very shortly. And in some ways, to get a basic understanding, it's easier just to sort of see how this works by example. But we're so close that I figure I may as well give a proper proof um, that this formula holds true. So here's the proof. Now on one hand, it might be hard to, now on one hand, it might be hard to internalize this. Now on one hand, it might be hard to internalize this on a first viewing, but on the other hand, it's just so interesting and there's so much here. I mean, I feel like if you can follow this argument, then you're making significant progress towards understanding topos theory because we really see a lot of the ideas playing together in this argument. So here's um, my kind of attempt at proving that this statement is correct, okay? That the classifying arrow of the intersection of these subobjects A and B is equal to and after chi of A, comma, chi of B. So firstly, what is this? Really, this is chi of T, comma, T after chi of A, comma, chi of B. Because this symbol here is really just sort of shorthand for this this is really what we mean, chi of t comma t, this thing here, okay? Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to consider a general arrow h into x because we know that a cap b has the property that h is going to be in a cap b if and only if h is in a and h is in b. And moreover, this property really defines A cap B um, up to equivalence of subobjects. Um, this is really the defining feature. So, okay, let's suppose that we have the classifying arrow of A cap B. So, if that's so, then for this general arrow H, we want that doing this classifying arrow, chi of A cap B after h, should, we wanted to send everything to true if and only if h is in a cap b. And we know that h is in a cap b if and only if h is in a and h is in b. Now, h is in a and h is in b 
if and only if the classifying arrows of if and only if the classifying arrows of A and B both send everything to true when we compose them with H. So we're going to have that H is in A and H is in B, if and only if, chi A of H sends everything to true and chi B of H sends everything to true. This is just from sort of the basic ways that classifying arrows work. Now we have, so okay, I want to sort of make sure I'm delineating this properly, delineating this properly, so there we are. So okay, we have these two statements, we want them both to be true. So we're gonna put them together, we'll pair them together, okay? So this is gonna hold true if and only if we have that chi A after H comma chi B after H is T comma T after exclamation mark H. So we can see that, you know, we could send that exclamation mark H inside the brackets if we wanted. And then we'd literally just have these two equations expressed in pairwise form. It's just, I wanted to move that exclamation mark H outside of the right bracket. Now, the reason I wanted to do that is because I want to see that this equation here is just equivalent to saying that chi a h comma chi b h is in t comma t. So in the picture, I'm really talking about this kind of composition of these arrows here. So this would be chi a comma chi b after h. And I'm saying that the only way that this can be in t comma t, I'm saying that saying this is in t comma t is just equivalent to saying that this green arrow here, this composition, is equal to t comma t after after exclamation mark h, because sending everything to one is the only kind of intermediary we can use to prove that this arrow is in t comma t. So basically, what I'm saying is we have chi a after h comma chi b after h equals t comma t after exclamation mark h happens if and only if chi a after h comma chi b after h is in t comma t. Now the next step we're just going to reorganize this part here by just moving this h outside of these brackets. So we rewrite it like this. And so basically all we're saying now is we have this arrow which is just this green one I've drawn here. And we're saying we're interested in the condition for this arrow to be in T comma T. And so once again, we're talking about an arrow being in a subobject. So now we can use again, the familiar property of our subobject classifier. So whenever we have a monomorphism, in this case, this T comma T and Whenever we have another arrow coming in to the targets of our monomorphism, in this case, chi a comma chi b after h, um, what we're going to have is that this green arrow is going to be in this white arrow if and only if doing the classifying arrow after this green arrow sends everything to true. So saying that this is in this is equivalent to saying that doing the classifying arrow of this after this sends everything to true. So saying chi a comma chi b after h is in true comma true is equivalent to saying that chi of true comma true operating on chi a comma chi b after h is going to send everything to true. In other words, it's going to be T after exclamation mark H. So now we're actually done. Okay, why are we done? Well, just take a look at this. You see that this here is just the same as this here. And if you replace this thing in red that I've underlined with 
chi A cap B, then you get this thing that we started with, okay? And here's the thing. If you recall the definition of the classifying arrow of A cap B, it's defined as the unique arrow from X to omega, which is such that for any H, we have that H is in A cap B, if and only if doing this classifying arrow from X to omega um, after H gives you true after exclamation mark H. But we've just shown that using this form has this property. So the thing is that what's the definition of chi of A cap B? Well, it's defined such that it's going to send any H to true if and only if H is in A cap B, okay? Um, but there's only supposed to be one classifying arrow uh, for A cap B. That's part of the definition of a subobject classifier, that for any subobject, for example, A cap B, there's just this one unique classifying arrow chi of a cap b, which goes from the target of a cap b to omega and has the property that composing it with an arrow sends everything to true if and only if that arrow is in a cap b. And but here we've just made another arrow from x to omega, this one here, chi of t comma t after chi of a comma chi of b which has this property exactly what we want it sends every when we do this arrow of underlined in red after a h it sends everything to true if and only if that h is in a cap b so this thing i've underlined must be chi of a cap b because it has exactly the property that we want it to have and there's only one arrow that has that property. So these two things have to be the same. And that's why I write this equation here. Now, what are the implications of this? The implications are that if we want to work out the intersection of two subobjects of X, all we have to do is find their classifying arrows, pair them together, compose them with this kind of AND arrow here, and then that'll give us a classifying, and then that'll give us an arrow from X to omega. And then if we just pull back true along that arrow, we pull back true along this arrow of underlined, um, that will give us the sub -ob that will give us this subobject we're after. That will give us a cap B. In other words, doing and after the pairing of the classifying arrow of A and the classifying arrow of B will give us the classifying arrow of A cap B. And once we have that, we can just pull the true arrow along that to find A cap B, at least up to equivalence. Okay then, so in order to understand how this kind of AND operation works, what we're gonna do is look at it working in a practical example. So we're going to consider the category of sets, which is a topos, so it has this subobject classifier, which is basically the sets with true and false in it. Of course, this element true is pointed out by a sort of arrow from the singleton set, the terminal object, into omega, which is basically pointing out this true element here. And we're going to consider a situation where we have this set X, the set with one, two, and three in it. And what we're going to suppose is that we have these two subobjects of X. We have A, which is just this subset consisting of one and two, as represented by this monomorphism little a. And also we have this monomorphism little b, picking out this subset two and three. 
Now, what we want to do is to determine the intersection of A and B. We're going to do this using this important formula that chi A intersection B is equal to and of chi of A comma chi of B. So the first thing we're going to want to do is to get chi of A and chi of B. And they're just the classifying arrows associated with these monomorphisms, okay? So basically, they're just these arrows from X to omega here, which just send the elements that belong to the subset to true and the other elements to false. So chi of A sends one and two to true because they're in this chosen subset, but it sends three to false. Similarly, since B basically picks out this subset of two and three, we have that chi of B sends two and three to true and one to false. So, okay, fine. We have chi A and chi B. We'll have to form this pair arrow later, but this pair arrow, chi A comma chi B, is an arrow from x to omega times omega. So actually, let's, let's form that pair now. So we can do this just using the familiar formula that chi A comma chi B operating on an element y of x will send it to chi A of y comma chi B of y. Okay, so since chi A sends 1 to true and chi B sends 1 to false, chi A comma y B ought to send 1 to true comma false. Okay, that's just using this formula. Now, since chi A sends 2 to true and chi B sends 2 to true, we have that chi A comma chi B ought to send 2 to true comma true and finally since chi a sends 3 to false and chi b sends 3 to true we have that chi a comma chi b ought to send 3 to false comma true so now in purple we've drawn this arrow chi a comma chi b and this is an arrow from x to omega times omega this is the product of omega with itself okay so we've constructed this arrow here finally we need to construct this arrow here this and arrow and if you recall and is just the classifying arrow of t comma t. So here, this monomorphism here is t comma t, and so its classifying arrow sends t comma t to true, and everything else gets sent to false. And so this white arrow here, we can call it and. Okay, we're getting somewhere now then. So all we have to do now is compute and after chi A comma chi B. So all we have to do is compose these arrows together. So one gets sent to TFA, which gets sent to false. Two gets sent to TT, which gets sent to true. 3 gets sent to FAT, which gets sent to false. 4. So what I've drawn here in green then, this is going to be the classifying arrow of A cap B.
And so finally, um, now we have the classifying arrow of A in section B, all we need to do is to all we need to do is find a subobject of X that this is the classifying arrow of. So in order to do that, we just need to pull back this true arrow along chi A comma B. In other words, we just have to isolate the set of elements in here that gets sent to true. And that just consists of the number two. So we could represent So we could think of this subobject A intersection B, if we want to represent it as an inclusion function, we can think of it as just this element holding two here. And uh, this arrow here, we can call A cap B. And you see that indeed this is the intersection of this set A and this set B. I mean, notice that according to the way I did this construction, the final step is just to pull back this true arrow along this green A cap B, along this green chi A cap B arrow. And yes, that will give a monomorphism of this form, but the fact that it's labelled with a two is just my choice. Um, I could have labelled this element something different. Um, there's no reason why this is literally going to be the intersection of A and B um, when we uh, consider sort of names of elements, but it will be isomorphic to the intersection of A and B. And um, one can do this kind of this kind of setup for lots of other interesting toposes, like you can find intersections of graphs, intersections of dynamical systems. That's a very interesting one to do. Um, so I think actually doing your own examples like this is such a great way to learn topos theory. I, I, um, I understand that there's a lot of abstract matters and um, often one has to sort of think a lot about algebra and stuff like that. But I don't think there's any substitute for like drawing things out in a really visual way. And I encourage you to pick your own examples in the category of sets and for other toposes um and sort of draw out how these logical operations work because it's very very entertaining um so just to quickly recap what we've done um we calculate omega times omega we find this tt subobject of it we find the classifying arrow of t comma t that's this and arrow okay um we have these two monomorphisms little a and little b that we want to sort of do find the intersection of so we find the classifying arrows of these monomorphisms we pair them together as an arrow from x into omega times omega and we compose that with the and arrow we get a new classifying arrow and then we pull back true along that classifying arrow and that basically gives us the intersection of the monics the thing we're looking for and this same basic process can be used in all sorts of toposes to determine the intersections of objects. And I think the really, really nice thing about this is that we obtain this and arrow, which remember we can think of being defined as chi t comma t in general. Now, um, you will often find that people prefer to write this expression here and after chi a comma chi b as chi a and chi b. And that's because this kind of operation um, is very closely related to what we mean when we say and in everyday kind of talking about logical things. It's just for some reason us humans prefer to put and as a kind of infix operator instead of a prefix operator. So I say I'm wearing a shirt and I'm wearing socks. I don't say and open bracket. I'm wearing a shirt, comma, I'm wearing socks, close bracket. Um, so I think this just has to do with the way we speak. So you'll often see people writing 
Kai A, comma, Kai, so you'll often see people writing Kai A and Kai B, um, but when you really want to translate it into terms of arrows, when you can really literally understand what's been meant, um, it's, you know, you really want to think of this and being up at the front and really just being a sort of symbol representing Kai T, comma, T. Okay, so one of the most useful ways to think about sub-object classifiers in toposes is that they allow us to go between these two different kinds of arrows. So if we have a sub-object of A, then we can find a classifying arrow of it, and that's going to be an arrow from A to V. So there's a unique way of going from here to here, um, just by finding the classifying arrow of a monomorphism, okay? Um, and we can also think about going the other way around. So let's just say we have some object A in our topos, and we have an arrow V from A to omega. Well, what we can do is we can pull back true along V, and that is going to give us a, gonna give us a sub-object V star of A. Now, um, be careful here because this V star is only really defined up to the equivalence of monomorphisms, okay? Normally, when we do a pullback like this, we won't get just one specific form for this pullback. There may be a whole class of different equivalent monomorphisms. And so what we can imagine is that for each of these kind of equivalence classes, of monomorphisms. I mean, we can imagine arranging our monomorphisms into these kind of classes, uh, putting them in the same class when, um, putting two monomorphisms in the same class when they're equivalent to one another. Um, and then we can imagine picking a sort of representative from every class of equivalent monomorphisms. Um, and so then we can imagine that V star is the kind of representative. Um, so this is our sort of specially chosen monomorphism that we're going to use, that we're going to ob choose to obtain when we want to do a pullback of T along V, okay? So, I mean, in practical situations, this isn't usually too relevant. I mean, to be quite honest, usually when we're doing topos theory, we don't really care um, exactly which member of a class of equivalent monomorphisms we pick. Um, we just pick one and usually we don't worry too much about exactly which one it is because um, if we have two that are equivalent then they're going to have similar features anyway. So what difference does it make exactly which one we pick? And um, secondly, there's usually um, in many cases that we work with, there's a very natural choice about exactly which monomorphism here we should pick to kind of be the sort of um, representative of, of a whole class of equivalent monomorphisms. Because if we're working in something like the category of sets or the category of functors into sets from some category C, then we have this idea of these kind of inclusion monics, which basically look like they're just kind of including um, the elements of sort of subsets or structured subsets into superstructures. And we can always pick, um, and for any kind of class of equivalent um, monomorphisms, we can always just pick one of those kind of inclusion monics and that serves as a good representative, okay? So once we've made these kind of selections, uh, then we really do have this proper sort of isomorphism, okay? And really this gives a very nice concise way of thinking about the essential uh, stuff that, and really this gives a very nice way of thinking about the essential kind of things that having a sub-object classifier in a topos gives us. OK, um, because basically the idea is just that whenever we have an arrow V from some A to omega, 
we can think of that as defining a subobject of A um, just by pulling true along V, and that gives us this subobject V star, which, as I say, we can think of as a specially chosen um, member of this kind of class of equivalent subobjects of A, which all have V as their classifying arrow. And then conversely, uh, given this, um, and then conversely, uh, given a subobject V star of A, um, if we just let V be the classifying arrow of V star, then um, we can go from here to here, okay? Just like if we set that to be chi of V star, um, we'd have this pullback square row. So all that stuff being said, um, now I want to define some more kind of topos theory gadgetry, okay? Um, so we've already seen in previous videos, we, have, we can have this idea of one subobject being contained in another subobject, okay? And this is a concept that's kind of happening on this level, okay? It's happening on the level of subobjects when we have many sub when we have two subobjects of A, it may be that one of them is contained in another. But it turns out that there's a kind of corresponding concept that can happen on this kind of level. So um Basically, we use this symbol, less than or equal to, with a little subscript one, um, to denote this kind of thing. So let's think about this level for a start. So this is how we write that a subobject V star of A is contained in a subobject W star of A. And all this actually means is that V star is in W star. It just means that there exists a K such that W star after K equals V star. But we found in previous videos that there's an equivalent way that we can express this. So one of the results we've already obtained is that V star is contained in W star if and only if V star is equivalent to V star intersection W star. And if you just think about what this means in set, for example, you see that it makes a lot of sense, right? Because if we intersect V star with W star, we just get V star in this case when V star is contained in W star. But anyway, we've proved that this formula holds for general subobjects and of course, this is the kind of formula that lives at this type of level. It talks about subobjects of A. But it turns out that there's a corresponding kind of idea that works on the level of arrows into omega from A. This is really how we write the corresponding idea. So, OK, let me now define what this concept involving this symbol less than or equal to subscript 1, um, which I'm claiming is sort of parallel to this contains concept. Let me define what this concept is properly, okay? So consider the object omega times omega, the product of omega with omega. Well, what I've just been talking about is this and arrow. Remember the classifying arrow of t comma t. And that's obviously an arrow from omega times omega to omega. And here, is another arrow from omega times omega to omega. This P1 here, this is just the first projection arrow involved with this product, okay? Um, and so all we do, we have these parallel arrows and we consider what is the equalizer of these two arrows. And that's going to be a subobject of omega times omega. And we just call that subobject less than or equal to subscript one. And um, this is a monomorphism. We call the source of a monomorphism omega subscript one, but that's just a name, okay? We could have called it anything. But okay, now we see, but okay, so we've defined this, but now we're gonna see that it has some very interesting kinds of properties. Um, 
So in particular, let's suppose that we have a couple of arrows, V and W, that come from some object A and go into omega. Okay, so if we pair V and W together, we can think of this pair as being a single arrow from A to omega times omega. And then, of course, we have this sub-object, less than or equal to subscript 1, of omega times omega. And then the interesting thing that we'll note it, and then the interesting thing that we notice is that we have V comma W is going to be in this sub-object, less than or equal to subscript 1, if and only if V is equal to V and W. So, okay, the reason that this result holds true has to do with a special property of equalizers, which we've already encountered before. And that is that an equalizer like this, being an equalizer of these two arrows, has the property that any arrow into the target of this monomorphism is going to be in this arrow here, less than or equal to subscript 1, if and only if doing this arrow after this green one yields the same result as doing this arrow after this green one. So in other words, we're going to have V comma W is in this equalizer here, if and only if doing AND after V comma W equals doing P1 after V comma W. Well, doing P1 after V comma W just gives us V and this thing here and after V comma W, we just traditionally write that by taking this and inside here. So this really V and W is just sort of semi erroneous shorthand for this. This is really what this means. To really interpret this properly in terms of category theory, whenever we see this, we ought to just think, oh, well, that's just shorthand, which means, which means and after V comma W, because we've already seen this makes a lot more sense. This actually tells us what's going on in the Topos theory. So, okay, hopefully I've convinced you now then that we're going to have V comma W in less than or equal to subscript 1, if and only if V equals V and W, okay? Um, and let me just say another piece of commonly used kind of abbreviations um, is this. Typically, instead of writing this, authors will write V less than or equal to 1, W, okay? And they're really thinking of this less than or equal to 1 thing as a kind of ordering. And we also can say that V less than or equal to 1, W occurs if and only if V is equal to V and W because of the way that this less than or equal to 1 thing is defined by the equalizer of these two arrows. And now what I claim is as follows. Okay, so we have these arrows V and W. These are arrows from A to omega. So we can think of those as happening on this kind of level. Now we know we can also go to this kind of level by thinking about which subobjects are classified by these arrows and we get to here. And at this kind of level we may have this sort of we may have this sort of phenomenon occurring. We may have that V star is contained in W star. So this is saying one subobject of A is contained in another subobject of A. This is happening at this kind of level. Now I claim that this kind of phenomenon, when these cases where we write V less than or equal to one W, or more precisely when we write V comma W is in less than or equal to one, um, I claim that this is the sort of equivalent of this kind of thing happening, but when it happens at this level, we write it like this, and when it happens at this level, 
we write it like this because this is comparing arrows from a to omega whereas this is comparing these sub objects of a okay um, so to put it more precisely what I'm claiming is that we have v less than or equal to 1 w if and only if v star is contained in w star where remember v star is this sub object classified by v and w star is a sub object classified by w so how can we see a proof for this well let's start here we'll start with this um, that v star is contained in w star now i proved in a previous video that saying that v star is contained in w star is equivalent to saying that v star is equal to v star intersection w star and just for a quick kind of test we can see that this kind of thing at least makes sense in the category of sets right um because if we think of these as subsets this um, subset v star will be contained in w star if and only if the intersection of this v star with w star is v star itself but this result is more general and we've already proved in a previous video that this holds for general kind of sub objects okay and so we have this result here which says that v star is contained in w star if and only if v star is equivalent to v star intersection w star but the thing is that we've also shown that two sub objects are equivalent to each other if and only if they have the same classifying arrows so this holds if and only if the classifying arrow of this sub object equals the classifying arrow of this subject object hence we can write that this line holds if and only if chi of v star equals chi of v star intersection w star and we know what chi of v star is we know what the classifying arrow of v star is it's just v that's how we really define v star okay so we know that chi of v star equals v and we know that chi of v star intersection w star is equal to v and w well okay um, if we're being really precise we should probably write this as and open bracket v comma w because using this kind of and um, sort of as infix notation in the middle of our symbols is a little bit um, dodgy if we really want to stick with precise category theory terminology we should write this like this but I'm just going to think of that as a sort of abbreviation for this and not worry too much about that little detail. So anyway, we've seen that this is the classifying arrow of this sub object here um, just a few minutes ago. OK, when we were looking at how when we we're looking at these relationships between this kind of logical and operator and the idea of intersections of sub objects. So basically what that means is what we've got so far is that V star is contained in W star if and only if V equals V and W. And also up here, look, we have that V equals V and W if and only if V is less than or equal to one W. So this holds if and only if v is less than or equal to one w so we've proved our results we've proved this result circled in yellow so we can see now that this less than or equal to one kind of relation is such that two arrows into omega are going to be in this less than or equal to one relation which is happening at this kind of level if and only if the corresponding kind of sub objects are such that the first one is contained in the second one which is something that's happening at this kind of level well it suggests a good way to think about what this kind of notation means okay so when we write that v less than or equal to one w 
what we're really saying is that the subobject classified by V is contained in the subobject classified by W. Now, the way it works is that basically when you have an arrow that goes into omega, um, that's going to be classifying some subobject. And the more stuff that your arrow is sending to true, the bigger the subobject will be that you're classifying, right? Because it's essentially some kind of generalization of the idea of one of these kind of indicator functions. The more things you're sending to true, the more things you're saying are present in this subobject that you're classifying. And so, um, since saying v is since saying v less than or equal to one w is equivalent to saying that the subobject classified by v is contained in the subobject classified by w. That means that a nice way we can think of the meaning of this is we can think that v less than or equal to 1 w is kind of like saying that w is at least as true as v. And why is that? Well, the reason is because if you have any arrow h into a, so the reason is that if you have any arrow h into a, and this is holding true, then what you've got is that V after H is sending everything to true, implies H is in V star. And since we're assuming this, we know we have this, so we know that V star is contained in W star. So we know that this then implies that h is in w star and this then implies that wh sends everything to true so basically we have that whenever v so basically um, when this holds we have that whenever composing so basically when this holds we have that whenever v sends an arrow to true we must have that w sends the arrow to true and that is the kind of sense in which w is at least as true as v so okay then let's just zoom out a bit how can we really think about what this less than or equal to one symbol means well i mean yeah, we like to write this V less than or equal to W, but this is just an abbreviation. The real thing that happens is that sometimes we have a pair of arrows, V comma W, which are going to be coming from some object A into omega. And sometimes we'd say that that pair is in less than or equal to 1. So what less than or equal to 1 really is, is it is a subobject of omega times omega. And what we can really think of this as is a kind of internalization of this way we have of seeing whether one subobject of A is contained in another one. OK, so if we have these arrows V and W from A to Omega, then they're going to have these corresponding subobjects V star and W star. And it may be that v star is contained in w star in the sense that there exists a k such that v star is w star after k all right um but in order to check that kind of stuff you sort of have to look externally um and you have to sort of say oh well are there arrows that do this and that and kind of take this more zoomed out view but i mean what this less than or equal to one thing does is it really sort of internalizes this kind of information um, and expresses it just as a kind of subobject of omega times omega and it does so in the following sense in the sense that given these v and w which correspond to v star and w star if we just sort of pair these two arrows together to make this pair v comma w then we're going to be able to see that v comma w is in this less than or equal to one 
subobject here precisely when we have that V star is contained in W star. So for example, um, this less than or equal to one is a subobject of omega times omega and in the category of sets, it looks like this subset that I've highlighted in red. So if we take the special case where A is just a singleton and we consider, for example, the case where V comma W is equal to false comma true, then clearly this V comma W is going to be in this less than or equal to subobject. Sort of correspondingly, we're going to have the, the subobject classified by W. In other words, W star here is just going to be another arrow from a singleton set because W is true. So W star is just going to be the kind of identity arrow. This subobject sub W star classified by W equals true is just going to be this kind of full subobject of our singleton set. On the other hand, V equals false. And so V doesn't send anything to true. And so the subobject classified by V is just going to be this arrow from the empty set, okay? Which actually turns out to be the initial object. And, um, and so this is gonna be what the subobject classified by V looks like. And so here we're illustrating a case where indeed we do have, as we should, that V comma W is in this less than or equal to one. And it's true that W is at least as true as V because W is true and V is false. And also, of course, we have that V star is contained in W star, as it should be. Indeed, the empty set is contained in this full subset of this singleton set here. Okay then, so continuing on from the blackboard, recall that this less than or equal to one monomorphism here, this subobject of omega times omega, is defined as the equalizer of AND and P1. So what we're going to do now is define something which I often call the implies arrow, but it's, I think it's more correctly known as the material conditional arrow. And basically, we can think of this as just being the classifying arrow of this less than or equal to one monomorphism. Okay, so when we So this arrow here is such that if we pull back true along it, we get this less than or equal to one monomorphism. So I just introduce a couple of pieces of abbreviation, which are quite helpful to us. So one of them is, um, so one piece of abbreviation is, well, a common theme in topos theory is we keep considering these arrows that come from an object and then go to the terminal object. So for example, this arrow exclamation mark A, uh, composed with another arrow, which is this true arrow. So together, these red arrows composed would be true after exclamation mark A. But since that kind of thing comes up so much, we have an abbreviation for it. We often just write it as, T subscript A. So that would denote this arrow after this arrow. The other thing, which is again, this kind of um, introduction of prefix notation to make our symbols look more like those which occur in ordinary logic is that when we have this material conditional arrow after V comma W, in other words, when we have arrow v comma w often we just write that as v arrow w okay sometimes i might just say v implies w when i'm reading out a 
description of an arrow like that. So the, what are we to make of this implies arrow? Well, I think this is, um, this sheds some light on it. So the important thing, or one important thing is that when V implies W is true, and when I say is true, I mean technically is equal to T after exclamation mark A, uh, but you know, we're now writing that as TA. And again, I mean, technically this should be implies V comma W. But we're using these abbreviations, okay? Um, so V implies W is true if and only if arrow V comma W is T after exclamation mark A. If and only if chi of less than or equal to one after V comma W is T after exclamation mark A. That's just substituting in what the meaning of this arrow is. And this happens if and only if V comma W is in less than or equal to one. This is just going from this kind of classifying arrow based way to talk about this V comma W to actually directly talking about V comma W being in this monomorphism less than or equal to one. And this happens if and only if V is less than or equal to W. This is just um, another abbreviation. I mean, really, we can think of this as an abbreviation for this upper line. And then this happens if and only if V star is contained in W star. Well, we've already proved that. So essentially, um, we can think that to say that V implies W is true um, really kind of means that W is at least as true as V in some sense. So, okay, I want to define another arrow that's pretty closely related to this material conditional. So let's suppose we have a setup like this. We have an object A and we have an arrow from A to omega called V and an arrow from A to omega called W. And then we'll let V star and W star be the subobjects of A respectively classified by that V and that W. So now if we compose this material conditional after V comma W, we can call that arrow V implies W, this orange arrow here. And notice that that's an arrow from A to omega. So what we do then, we define this subobject of A called V star double arrow W star as the subobject of A which is classified by this arrow V implies W that we already know about. Okay. So essentially then in general, just given any couple of subobjects of A, like in our case, V star and W star, we can just say, well, what's the subobject classified by the classifying arrow of the first, we can just say, well, what's the subobject classified by writing the classifying arrow of the first monomorphism implies the classifying arrow of the second monomorphism. So in our case, since we're using this star notation, like we're writing uh, V star for the subobject classified by V and so on. In our case, we're saying, well, um, this V star double arrow W star is the subobject classified by chi of V star implies chi of W star. But we know in our case that chi of V star is just V and chi of W star is just W. So, okay, I want to discuss this interesting theorem uh, considering uh, this kind of double arrow thing. So since I'm using a bit of different notation here, I'll just uh, go over the definition again. So suppose we have these two subobjects little q and little r of A. 
and we'll let chi of Q and chi of R be their classifying arrows. Now we define Q double arrow R to be the subobject of A, which is classified by this arrow, chi of Q implies chi of R. this orange one here. And now our result is concerning another subobject, S of A. And what we're claiming is that S intersection Q is contained in R, if and only if S is contained in Q implies R. So a way we can think of this is for example, in the category of sets, we can think of Q and R as subsets. And then we can think of this Q implies R as the subset, which is such that whenever something's in Q, it has to also be in R. So basically, the region that has everything apart from this stuff that's just in Q. And now if we think about another subset S, like this one say, then that's going to be, then what this result saying is that that S is going to be contained in Q implies R, if and only if, we have that wherever S intersects with Q, that region is contained in R. So I'll put the proof of this result um, in the description to the video because my proof's a little bit lengthy. Um, but here's a very useful result that I do make use of within the proof. Um, so the basic idea is that, say we have a subobject A of X, and this is in general, okay? Um, and let's let chi of A be its classifying arrow. And now let's also suppose that there's another arrow, little v, that goes into X. Now the thing is that chi of A after v is gonna be an arrow from the source of this little v to omega. And so as such, we can think of this chi A after V as a classifying arrow. Well, let me call the source of little V W actually, so it's less confusing. Um, so we can think of chi of A after V as the classifying arrow of some subobject of W. So which subobject is it? Well, um, is there a way to construct it? Well, it turns out that the subobject classified by chi of A after V is going to be the pullback of A along V, which I may sometimes call V to the minus one of A. Um, indeed, this is the inverse image of A along V. So how can we see this? Well, one can see this using the kind of uh, well-known pullback lemma. So this is something I just mentioned in my video on pullbacks, um, but you can find a proof in the description to that. But the basic pullback lemma that we use to prove this says that when we have a situation like this, where we have a diagram that looks like this in a topos, and the right square is a pullback square, as we know it is, then the pullback lemma says that the left square will be a pullback square if and only if the kind of outer rectangle of this diagram forms a pullback square. So in our case, the way we reason is as follows. We say that, well, this left monomorphism will be the subobject classified by 
chi of a after v, if and only if this outer rectangle forms a pullback. And then according to the pullback lemma, that occurs if and only if this left square is a pullback, which occurs if and only if this red arrow on the left here is the pullback of a along v. Anyway, this is making use of that pullback lemma, which is a fairly useful result. So you can look back at the video on pullbacks um, and you can dig out a proof to this pullback lemma. Um, alternatively, you can just Google pullback lemma. It's, it's quite a well-known result. And um, I mean, I'd recommend to somebody to go through a proof of it at least once because it's it is used quite a bit in category theory. Anyway, um, so we use that result um, to prove this result, which is this claim that S intersection Q is contained in R if and only if S is contained in Q double arrow R. And um, this is actually an interesting result that um, we'll see allows us to make some connections with the idea of exponential objects when we take a certain kind of viewpoint um, on what's going on with these sub objects and this logic and things. So I'll put a proof to this result I'll put a link to a proof to this result in the description. Okay then, so now I want to introduce this fascinating idea of power objects. So recall that one of the things that we wanted our topos to have was exponential objects. Now, one of the main reasons for this is so we can take our sub-object classifier and raise it to the power of objects. And this essentially gives us a kind of generalization of the idea of a set of subsets. Because a set of subsets is an object in the category of sets that represents the collection of all subsets of a particular object in that category okay um, and we can do a similar kind of generalized thing uh, in a general topos so remember that if we have an object a in a topos then arrows from a to omega correspond to sub objects of a now when we write omega to the power of a we're talking about this exponential object and there's more to it's than this, but um, one can at least start by thinking of omega to the power of a as a sort of internalization of the collection of arrows from a to omega. And every such arrow from a to omega corresponds to a sub-object of a. So we can think of omega to the power of a as this kind of internal representation of the collection of sub-objects of a. So, okay, one of the things then is that points of omega to the power of a, as in arrows into it from the terminal object, each of those represents a sub-object of a. So, just to very briefly um, indicate how that's the case, Let's just think about that. So, well, suppose we have a point of omega to the power of a, and we'll write that as gamma transpose. Okay, it's just a name, really. Um, but under the kind of correspondence with a, uh, via exponential objects, this corresponds to an arrow gamma from 1 times a to omega. And 1 times a is basically just the isomorphic to a. And this arrow, exclamation mark a comma 1a, is an isomorphism. So this arrow gamma here corresponds to this arrow, gamma exclamation mark a comma 1a. And let's give this another name. Let's call it zeta. Okay. So this zeta here is just an arrow from a to omega. And then, of course, zeta star 
is just going to be a sub-object of A. And in, that's the sense in which points of this power object correspond to sub-objects of A. And in fact, if you remember the notation from our previous discussion of exponential objects, um, you'll notice that we can write this gamma transpose, this point of omega to the power of A we started with, as the name of zeta. So yes, the basic idea of a, of a power object of A is omega to the power of A. Now notice that we have this evaluation arrow, uh, which, which we could call E A comma omega, and that's an arrow from omega to the power of A times A to omega. Now we could just call that E for short. And what does it do? Well, if you think about it operating on a point of omega to the power of A and a point of A, then if we're thinking about a set, for example, um, then using these different isomorphisms, as I've indicated, we could think of a point of omega to the power of A as something like a subset of A. I mean, it, it kind of corresponds to one under these various isomorphisms involving exponential objects and subobject classifiers. And also a point of capital A, we could just think of as an element of A. And so when we do this evaluation arrow on a point of omega to the power of A paired with the point of A, the way we can think of this is E here is really sort of testing for us whether this element A is in this subobject or not, okay? Because it's sending those things to this omega, this subobject classifier, this truth value object, and it'll send such a pair to true when this element here is in this subset or false otherwise. So let's see a formalization of that idea, but not just in the category of sets. Let's see the idea in general, okay? Um, so what we do, we notice that this evaluation arrow E is an arrow from omega to the power of A times A to omega. So since it's, this is an arrow to omega, we can consider this to be the classifying arrow of some subobject. Which subobjects? Well, we call the subobject in to the power of A. Um, and I should probably just point out there's a slight deviation here in the terminology I'm using um, as compared with Colin McCarthy's book, Elementary Categories, Elementary Top Losses, that um, I have been following in a, in a rough kind of way. So if you're comparing with that book, I'll just say briefly, um, he puts a twist in, um, but I don't. Anyway, um, so we basically have this idea that um, we consider this into the A arrow as the pullback of true along our evaluation arrow. Now, how can we think of this into the A subobject of omega to the power of A times A? Well, for example, in sets, so for example, in the category sets, we can think of omega to the power of A times A as this collection of all of the, of this collection of subsets of A paired with elements of A. And now, so say we have a subset of A paired with an element of A. Now, the evaluation arrow will send such a pair to true if A is in S and false if A is not in S. And we can think of this into the power of A thing here as selecting all of the pairs S comma A, such that A is in the subset S. So that's what's happening in the category set. And in a general topos, it's just kind of the analogy of that. And, and um, this is really the result which we get at in our next theorem. So um, before we do that, let's just introduce a little notation. 
So suppose we have an arrow h comma x, which goes into omega to the power of a times a. Now we write now we write x in a h as an abbreviation for saying that h comma x is in this into the power of a subobject here. And another way of saying that is that doing the classifying arrow on h to the power of x sends everything to true. Okay then, so we have this kind of intuitive idea that the way this evaluation arrow works is that it takes a subobject and something in A and it sort of tests whether that thing in A is in that subobject. So a good kind of place where we can get some real practical intuition about this, as in a case where we can really see this happening properly, is when we consider points. Okay, so we'll consider a point of A, and when I say a point of an object, I mean an arrow into that object from the terminal object. So we'll consider a point X of A, and we'll also consider a point of omega to the power of A. And so if we were dealing in the category of sets, for example, the point of capital A would be an element of A, and the point of omega to the power of A would correspond to a subset of A. Um, but for us, we're going to consider, we're going to suppose that we have an arrow W from A to omega. So we can think about W as being the classifying arrow of some subobject W star. So we can basically think of this W as representing a subobject W star of A. And then the other way we can interpret this W is as a point of omega to the power of A. And this is a notion of something called the name of W. Okay, so this is a notion which we encountered when we we're talking about exponential objects in a previous video. So um, W is an arrow from A to omega. The name of W is this arrow W after P2 all transposed, which is a point of omega to the power of A. And we'll see how it corresponds with an arrow from a to omega as follows. If we do the kind of untranspose of this point here, so this point here is W after P to all transpose. So if we just kind of untranspose it, we get this arrow W after P to, which is an arrow from the terminal object times A to omega. But the terminal object times A is basically just isomorphic to A this second projection P2 here being an isomorphism. So we can really just think of this arrow W after P2 as just corresponding to this arrow W from A to omega. And the way that exponential objects work with this kind of idea of the name of arrows fits together very nicely, as you can see in the video on exponential objects, but we won't need to go into such details here because we're going to prove this result directly. So what is our result? Well, our result is really helping us understand how this point X of A and this point name of W of omega to the power of A interact with each other. And what it says is that X is going to be in the subobject classified by W if and only if X is in to the power of A of the name of W, if and only if X is into the power of A, the name of W, okay? And when we write this, X is into the power of A, the name of W, we can really think of it as just a sort of abbreviation for actually saying that the evaluation arrow sends the name of W, comma X to true, okay? Because, I mean, in this general case, we have this notation. So if we have an arrow, this is in the general case, okay? If we have an arrow from capital H called little h comma x, which goes into omega to the power of a times a, then this notation x in a h is just abbreviation for saying h comma x is in this in a arrow. And the classifying arrow of this 
kind of sub object into the power of a thing here is just the evaluation arrow so saying h comma x is in this in a monic is equivalent to saying doing evaluation after h comma x sends everything to true and in our case when we say this point little x of capital a is into the power of a for name of omega this is just really a kind of shorthand for saying that doing the evaluation on the name of x this is really just shorthand for saying that doing the evaluation on the name of w comma x equals true so how are we going to prove this result then well the proof is actually quite straightforward it just involves looking at some kind of commuting diagrams so basically we just look at this sort of picture and firstly we notice that this um, this triangle here commutes um, I'll leave that to you as an exercise um, to prove that that triangle commutes it's just involving composing these arrows um, and then also this region here commutes so we can see this because the name of W is just W after P2 all transposed and so that means that this arrow here this composition of E after the name of W times 1 is just going to be W after P2 and doing this blue diagonally downwards arrow after this orange downwards arrow is just going to give us a W as we have over here okay so basically what I'm saying is that this region commutes and this region commutes so that means this whole big region commutes so okay we have these two regions commute well so what well the point is that x is in a name of w if and only if doing e after the name of w comma x is true and now e after the name of w comma x as in doing this arrow after this arrow well st since stuff commutes that's the same thing that we get as doing this arrow after this arrow after this arrow which is the same thing we get from when we do this arrow after this arrow so in other words we know by the commuting things in this diagram that e after the name of w comma x is equal to w after x and so basically what we've got then is that x is in a name of w if and only if w after x is true and that holds if and only if x belongs to the subobject classified by w which is the result that we wanted so how are we to interpret this result well basically what it's saying is that at least when we're having a look at points what we have is that this evaluation arrow here is going to send the name of w and this point x of a to true if and only if this point of x belongs to a subobject classified by w and also we can see that this kind of in arrow is like a subobject of omega to the power of a times a which is really selecting these kind of pairs of 
points of omega to the power of a and points of a which are really corresponding to these kind of pairs of sub-objects and points of a such that that point of a is actually inside that sub-object okay so this is really um giving us this kind of intuition i mean um the simple way to think of this in the category of sets is simply that a point of omega to the power of a is going to be like a subset of a and a point of capital a is going to be an element x of capital a and the evaluation arrow is going to send such a pair to true when x belongs to this subset s otherwise it'll send it to false and then in that case of the category of sets we can think of this into the power of a arrow as selecting all these pairs of subsets of a and elements of a such that that element belongs to that subset okay so if you've just seen power objects for the first time then this may be a bit too much information but as you start to use them quite a lot you start to realize that they basically give you another way to talk about sub objects and it's very useful if you want to um, talk about things like taking the union of several sub objects at the same time and you want to be able to um, talk about things like that in terms of arrows going between these kind of exponentiated objects there's lots of interesting things you can do and so this result um, really gives us a way to check whether a particular point is essentially in a particular sub object but doing so at the level of these kind of exponentiated things so i mean really when we see x in a name of w we can really read that as meaning that when we evaluate this name of w using this x here we get true okay um, so we can check this kind of thing because this is just a simple kind of um, compositional thing and it allows us to test if this point is really in this kind of sub object which w is describing now that's fine um, but you know what about if you're talking for example in the category of graphs and your sub object is a subgraph and you want to check if a particular edge is present in that subgraph let's say well you know in that sense this doesn't really help you um, so much because this just allows you to check if a point x is in your sub object w star um, but you might want to check if an arrow is in your sub object w star so that's the next topic we're going to talk about so this is a more general kind of result then and what it says is that say you have a sub object r star in other words suppose this sub object r star is the sub object is a sub object of a with a classifying arrow r and suppose this time that our arrow x comes from t to a so it's some general kind of t element of a and we want to really check is x in r star um, well this theorem what i'm calling theorem b here um, gives us a way to check this so it says that x is in r star if and only if x is in a name of r after exclamation mark t okay or in other words this happens if and only if doing the evaluation after the name of r exclamation mark t comma x sends everything to true in other words it's after it's equal to true t which is just shorthand for true after exclamation mark t so 
this is one result that's very useful. Um, it's actually kind of an instance of a more general result, which is this one here, what I'm calling theorem A, which says that if we have a sort of general arrow into omega to the power of A times A, say an arrow S transpose comma X from capital T to omega to the power of A times A, then we're going to have the identity of T comma X is in the subobject classified by S, as in S star, if and only if X is in a transpose S. Okay, um, so I'm not going to prove these in this video. I'll attach a proof to these results um, in the description to the video so you can check on them if you're interested. Um, these are the kind of things that come in very useful when you get into seriously wanting to um, manipulate power objects. And the proofs aren't very difficult, but I just figure I might as well get on to, I might as well carry on with things which are less kind of abstract for this kind of introductory video. Okay then, so now we have a bit more familiarity with the power object. It's time that we use it for something. So we've already introduced quite a lot of ideas from logic and um, soon I'm going to sort of fill in the gaps and introduce the other um, basic kind of logic operations. So we've already got under our belts and true and implies and soon we're also going to understand or not false and so on. So we're, we're going to have these kind of basic operations but there's a couple of other very important logical operations which kind of live on a higher level. In a sense, the previous ones I was talking about kind of live on the level of omega, the subobject classifier. But there's a couple of other logical kind of ideas, um, in particular for all, and there exist, which really make statements about whole subobjects. And um, they kind of live on a higher level. And to be able to manipulate them properly, we want to be able to um, look at them on the level of these power objects. So now I'm going to introduce the idea of for all. Okay. Um, so suppose we have an object E in our topos and we'll consider the power object omega to the power of E. Now we define this arrow called for all subscript E to be the classifying arrow of the name of TE. Okay, so the name of TE is an arrow from the terminal object into omega to the power of E, and it is um, and it is the transpose of P2 after TE, where of course TE is just shorthand for T after exclamation mark E. So how can we think of this? Well, as I've tried to argue, we can think of the points of omega to the power of E as kind of like encoded sub-objects, okay? They're like sub-objects, but they're encoded in this kind of um, exponential language. I mean, take a point of, take the transpose of it, um, find the arrow from E to omega it corresponds with, and then find the sub-object that that classifies. And that kind of unencodes it for you. So basically the name of TE is kind of like a, um, a fancy way of saying this is a point of omega to the power of E, which corresponds with the sub object of E classified by TE. So what is that? Well, let's just think about this. Okay. Um, so we have the name of TE, that's an arrow from 1 to omega to the power of A. Untransposing, we get it's this arrow TE after P2 from 1 times A to omega. And this P2 is really just an isomorphism uh, from 
1 times a to a, so really this just corresponds to this arrow te from a to omega. Um, and that's going to be a classifying arrow for a subobject of a, and that subobject is this identity of a, this maximal subobject. So basically, um, this point t name of te in omega to the power of e really just corresponds to the maximal subobject of e, the identity of e. How can we see that te or you know the longhand way is t exclamation mark e? How can we see that that is the classifying arrow of the identity of a? Well, consider the identity of a. And notice that for any arrow at all, V from H to A, we must always have that V is in the identity of A. V is equal to V after identity of A. And so what that means is that the classifying arrow of the identity of A, whatever it is, let's just call it chi of identity of A for now, it has to be some kind of arrow such that if we do it after V, we always get t exclamation mark h okay and there's only supposed to be one arrow like that but notice then that t after exclamation mark e has that property that if we do it after v we always get t after exclamation mark h so that proves that t after exclamation mark e must be the classifying arrow of the identity of e so okay that's fine um now what we do is so now what we do is we define this for all subscript e to be the classifying arrow of the name of te because the name of te is just a subobject of omega to the power of e and so we want this to be the kind of classifying arrow so essentially what this classifying arrow is doing so basically what this for all e is doing is it's going to send a point of omega to the power of e to true um, precisely when that point of omega to the power of e corresponds to the maximal subobject of e. Okay, so let's just have a look at this. Um, consider a point of omega to the power of e. If we do for all e after... So, okay, let's just see this. So consider a point of omega to the power of e. Um, let's call it name of w. So the thing is that we're going to have that doing for all E after the name of W, that's going to give us a true if and only if doing chi of the name of TE on the name of W is true. That's just substituting in um, what we know for all E is, okay, because it's defined like that. And then this is going to happen if and only if the name of W is in the name of TE. But the only way that can happen is if the name of TE after the identity arrow is the name of W. Because the identity arrow of 1 is the only arrow from 1 to 1. So um, basically, to conclude then, we have that doing for all E on the name of W is going to give us true precisely when this name of W is the name of TE. In other words, precisely when the name of W corresponds with this maximal subobject of E. Okay, so basically doing this for all E on a point of omega to the power of E tests whether that point corresponds to the maximal subobject of E or not. Okay, um, so it's useful in that sense, but it's actually more useful than that because basically um, it can help us test when a um, when something satisfies a particular relation um, across an entire variable. So I'll just introduce this idea here and I'll put links to a further video that gives more kind of elaboration and proof of this idea. Um, so let's suppose we have a relation on b times a and what i mean by that is we have a subobject of b times a okay so i mean think about this in the category of sets for example um 
we take the product of set B and set A, and then we select a kind of subset of them. That's defining a relation. Uh, but, you know, in general category theory, we just think of this as just a sub object R of B times A. And then we're going to define something new and we're going to um, call it for all A R. And it's defined to be the sub object classified by for all A after the transpose of the classifying arrow of R, okay? So the way we can think about this, um, I mean, basically we're talking about this arrow shown here on the left. So if you look at this diagram, we know that this right-hand square is a pullback square. And so another way we can think about what this for all AR is, is that it's the pullback of the name of TA over the transpose of the classifying arrow of chi R. And we can see that by the pullback lemma. I mean, um, this left, by the pullback lemma, this left square is a pullback if and only if the outer rectangle is a pullback. And according to the definition of for all they are that we gave up here, um, this outer rectangle should be a pullback because I basically said that um, we want for all they are to be the pullback of true along for all a after the transpose of chi r. So basically what I'm saying is an equivalent way that we can define for all they are is to say that it is the pullback of the name of TA along chi r transpose. So this is going to come in very useful when we start talking about the mitchell benabau language because it's going to give us our way to kind of think about um, this kind of universal quantification idea which turns out to be extremely useful for us um, and one of the central results is this one here which says that for an arrow so one of the central results is this one here which says that for an arrow w from zeta to b we're going to have that w is in for all a r if and only if w times the identity of a is contained in r and the way that we can think of this is that we can basically think that w is going to be in for all a r when um this w is in this kind of r relation with with everything in a okay um so so if you want to understand more about this um i urge you to have a look at the videos attached where i go through many of these ideas so if you want to look uh, understand more about this then i urge you to have a look at the videos in the description where I discuss these ideas in a more step-by-step -step fashion and go through the proof of this result. Um, another special case that you'll sometimes see is this case where W is a monomorphism. And in that case, of course, we'd write that W is contained in for all they are. And um, there's just another result that I just thought to mention because it's a cute little result um, that's quite helpful for understanding this kind of stuff. Um, so basically, it just says that if we have a couple of sub-objects of X, say A and B, um, then we're going to have that B is contained in A if and only if for every arrow M from H to B, we have that B after M is in A. So how can we see this result? Well, to see that this right statement implies this statement on the left, um, just take this right statement with M set to the identity of B. 
and then we just get directly that b is in a which since b is a um, sub object we'd write this containment symbol instead of this in symbol so that's fine uh, to show that this left statement implies this right statement notice that b is contained in a implies that there exists a k such that b equals a after k and so then we'd have that for any m we'd have that b after m equals a after k after m so clearly then we have that b after m is equal to a after some arrow so that's how this left statement implies this right statement so that's um that's the end of this kind of um stage of us unrolling this kind of um tour of some of the important results of topos theory the next step is we're going to have a look at the other kind of basic logical operations and how they might be defined now um my real goal here in this video um this first part which is just coming to an end now um is basically been working through uh, colin mcclarty's chapter on this elementary categories elementary toposes which is a a wonderful treatment of uh, topos theory if somewhat challenging to to read through um now basically all this stuff then in this first part has been preparation for um what i want to do in my next video which is to introduce the mitchell benabau language which is um it's probably my favorite mathematical language i mean it's extremely powerful it kind of allows us to do topos theory like set theory it allows us to reason a lot more easily and mechanically about topos theory it allows us to um tie in all our intuitions about um set theory and put them to use in topos theory and understand how that is basically the same thing as doing intuitionistic logic it it's a really really nice language it even involves like some ideas like lambda calculus and stuff it's um very very powerful and now we basically have enough knowledge to be able to understand how that stuff uh, works um so i want to get on to that in the next video now um in order for um that kind of expose to um really be um easy to think about um i also thought it's worthwhile and interesting um to talk about the kind of other some of the other kind of basic parts of topos theory like um how these other logical operations are defined um and also some other stuff now um especially when i'm introducing this logical these are logical operations which i'll do momentarily um i want you to bear in mind that the way i'm going to introduce them is basically um from digging out other kinds of um ways of talking about these things by other authors and and that's fine um and that's fine but really um a very nice kind of pure approach is the one taken by colin mcclarty where what he does is he basically just uses the topos theory that we've understood so far and basically what he then does is wraps that all up in the mitchell benabal language and then kind of uses that to sort of bootstrap itself and define all of the other logical operations and so on in terms of that language and that's fine in fact it's extremely interesting but um it's a bit weird okay because he's sort of defining other things for example he defines what or means and what there exists be he, for example he defines what 
or means and what not means and so on, just in terms of those other kind of logical operations which we've already understood so far. Um, and that's okay, but it's a little bit, um, sometimes the kind of mitchell Benabal language definitions of things can be somewhat uh, non-intuitive. So I thought it would be worthwhile to look at more direct ways to talk about these ideas, um, which are sort of taken from other, which are taken from other authors' approaches to top off theory. So that's what I'm going to do next. And then I'm also um, going to, then once I've defined those logical operations, I'm going to go through a quick sort of tour of more, um, I'm, I'm going to go sort of faster and deeper into some really, really um, interesting ideas of Topos theory, um, which are ideas like um, hating algebras and how they can be used to, and how those can be used to think about the organization of subobjects and things like that. And the reason I'm doing that is basically to try and give a kind of, um, to try and give a kind of bird's eye view of Topos theory. So we can really see how all these concepts hang together. So that last stage of the video is going to be a lot more, um, It's going to be a lot more sort of rough and fast moving and just um, really just showing you what, you know, the basic kind of structure behind things without necessarily going into so many proofs. So, okay, just before we move on, we can actually use this cute little result here that a subobject B will be contained in a subobject A if and only if B after M is in A for any arrow M coming into the source of this monomorphism little b. We'll be able to use this result to get quite a bit of understanding of the meaning of this theorem 13.9, which really gives us a way to understand what this notation for all a r means. So this says that um, this arrow w from zeta to b is going to be such that w is in for all a r if and only if w times the identity is contained in r. So um, using this kind of result, we can reinterpret this. So W times A, W times one A is contained in R, if and only if for every arrow H comma K into the source of W times one A, we have that doing W times one A on H comma K gives us something that's in R. And we can evaluate this to be W after H comma K. So, okay, this kind of result can help us to reason about what it means to have a W in for all they are. So consider the case where Zeta here is a terminal object. Um, so, in this case, what's it mean to have W in for all they are? Um, well, we can use this result, uh, but let's just look at the special case where Zeta is a terminal object. So in that case, this H, that's an arrow from C to Zeta, has to be exclamation mark C. It has to be this unique arrow from C to Zeta. And so, in that case, this result simplifies to be like this. So for a point of B, we're going to have that W is in for all they are. If and only if for any arrow K from C to A, we have the W after exclamation mark C comma K is in R. Okay, so essentially what this is saying is that what it means for W to be in for all they are is that this kind of arrow here, which can sort of point out anything K 
in A um, is always in R. So in other words, we can vary A, but if we keep this W fixed in B, then we'll always get something in R. Okay, so if you think about this in set, for example, if this is A going along here, and this is B, and we have our W here, let's say, a point of B, and then this R here is like a kind of uh, sub-object of this, then to say that W is in for all AR means that we can vary over A, but we always get something that's in this relation R, okay? Um, so we can see this, for example, if we consider the case where C here is the terminal object, and in that case, W is in for all AR means that for any point k of a, we always have w comma k is in r, okay? So this helps us to understand what this really means. It basically means, as the notation suggests, that we can vary what's in a, and we always get something that's in this relation r, when this point w of b is in for all they are. Okay then, so let's get on with defining the other kinds of logical operations for toposes. Um, so these are operations which we'll define in a different equivalent way um, when we get on to the mitchell Benabar language in the next video. But um, it's probably better I give you these sort of fast definitions of them um, because it'll make it easier to think about things. So firstly, um, our topos has a terminal object and an initial object, and there's this monomorphism um, from the initial object, the arrow from an initial object to another object is a monomorphism. And um, if we take this object to be the terminal object, then it's classifying arrow, which we could call chi of exclamation mark zero. That's what we define as false. And some authors write this as uh, like, like that. But anyway, I call it FA um, in accordance with, uh, go with um, McCarthy's notation. Um, not is defined as the classifying arrow of false. And I call not squiggle some authors call it like that. Um, so if we have an arrow W, uh, a kind of classifying arrow, say an arrow W from some object C to omega, then not of C um, is an arrow from C to omega. And we have the not of C is this arrow that sends everything to true if and only if W is equal to false after exclamation mark C. Okay, and this kind of arrow um, from C to omega, this false after exclamation mark C, this is the arrow that sends everything to false. And we can really think of this as the classifying arrow of the empty subobject of C the empty subobject of C being this unique arrow from the initial object into C. So this subobject of C is the arrow classified by false after exclamation mark C. Okay. Um, now in order to define or, um, I'm going to do it um, using the concept of an image. So this is basically this idea of an epimono factorization. Okay, so um, say we have an arrow F from an object A to an object B, um, then it's possible in a topos to factorize it in a way kind of unique up to isomorphism into a um, epimorphism Q followed by a monomorphism, which we call the image of F. So you can see we're doing this for this uh, function here. 
So you see here, we're doing this for this function here. Um, if we make this epimorphism that sends these two elements to this top one um, and this bottom element to this bottom one, then we can do a monomorphism to inject it. And this monomorphism is the image of F. It's essentially selecting the in set, at least it selects the kind of subset of stuff that has something sent to it under F. Okay. Um, now, Lavier gives a definition for an image of an arrow, which I imagine is equivalent um, to the um, definition, to the other definition I'm going to give, but this is something I haven't proved. So I just wanted to point that out. I don't like um, giving you information about results that I haven't gone through proofs of, but Lavier in page 336 of his wonderful book, Conceptual Mathematics, so Lavier defines the image of this arrow F to be a subobject of B such that F is in IMF and also for any subobject J of B we have that if F is in J then IMF is contained in J. So we can think of IMF as sort of the minimal subobject of B, which has F in it. Okay, so that's one way we can get at this IMF. Um, there's a sort of more constructive way, uh, which Goldblatt discusses in his book, Topoi, the Categorical Analysis of Logic on page 111. Uh, and I like this way more because it's more constructive. It really shows how to make these epimono factorizations. So what you do is you take your arrow F from A to B and you draw a couple of copies of it and then you find the push out of this. So you find this push out square and the new arrows you get, you call them I1 and I2. And then these are arrows from B to some object R. And then you find the equalizer of those arrows. And that is what IMF is. And um, it's interesting because um, F here also has the property that I1 after F equals I2 after F. And so F can be sort of thought of as a candidate for equalizing I1 and I2. And therefore there's a unique arrow from A to F the source of IMF, which is which we can call Q, which is such that IMF after Q equals F. And it turns out that this Q here is an epimorphism. And this triangle here actually gives us the epimono factorization of F. So using this idea of the image, we can then define the disjunction. So if we form omega plus omega, um, then we have this arrow um, from that to omega times omega. So this is the co-product of omega with itself. This is the product of omega with itself. And this arrow, which we'll call alpha, is, um, so I'm using square brackets for this kind of producty uh, way of pairing two arrows and angle brackets, of course, for the so I'm using these square brackets here for the kind of co-producty way of pairing two arrows and the angle brackets for the kind of producty way of pairing two arrows. And so we define this alpha to be open square bracket T omega comma one omega comma one omega comma T omega close square bracket. And then if we take the image of this alpha that's going to be a subobject of omega times omega. And then we can define or this kind of disjunction operation as the classifying arrow of the image of alpha. So this basically gives us our definition of disjunction. So the way that we can use this 
let's say we so we can use this idea to construct the union of two subobjects. So say we have a couple of subobjects A and B of H, then we can find their classifying arrows. So we find chi of A and chi of B and pair them together. And we get this arrow chi of A comma chi of B from H to omega times omega. And then if we do or after it, we can write that as or of chi of A comma chi of B. And this is the classifying arrow of A union B. Okay, so if we get this true arrow and pull it back along or after chi of A comma chi of B, we get this subobject A union B. So that's how we can construct the union. Um, also, as is usual, people often write this or of chi of A comma chi of B with the kind of infix notation like this, chi of A or chi of B. Now there's another way, a uh, sort of more direct way uh, that you can find the union of um, two subobjects. And Goldblatt discusses this on page 150. And that's simply that um, if you have these subobjects A and B of H, let's say they have sources capital A and capital B, well then if you get the co-product of these source objects, so you get A plus B, um, then you can form this kind of co-product pair arrow a comma B in square brackets. And then if you just take the image of that, you get A union B. So that's a very uh, fast um, coverage of the ideas of false, not and or. And um, like I say, we're going to approach these in a different way using the mitchell Benabal language in the next video. And also, um, you can get at these ideas using the idea of treating the... Um, you can sort of form a partially ordered set of the subobjects um, of an object, and then you can use this kind of hating algebra approach to get at these operations. And I'll discuss that um, very shortly in this video. And that's another, maybe even sort of simpler conceptual way to understand about how all these different operations emerge. Okay, so I should also just briefly mention another type of arrow, which is extremely useful for doing top loss theory. And the idea of this one is that this kind of diagonal arrow, 1a comma 1a, from a to a times a, is a monomorphism. And so it's going to have a classifying arrow. So we could call that chi of 1a comma 1a, or we could also call it delta a. And this is very useful because let's say we have a pair of arrows x and y from some object h into a. So we could write that as this arrow x comma y from h to a times a. And let's say we want to test whether x and y are actually the same arrow. So we can do this using this delta arrow because what we have is that delta a after x comma y is going to send everything to true if and only if x comma y is in 1a comma 1a. Well, what's that mean? Well, that happens if and only if there exists a k such that x comma y is equal to 1a comma 1a after k. And 1a comma 1a after k is just k comma k. So this is going to happen if and only if x equals y. So there we have it. Seeing that Composing delta a after x comma y, seeing if that gives true, is the same thing as seeing if x is equal to y. So we can use this kind of delta arrow to test 
if two arrows are equal. Okay, so this kind of delta arrow here, this classifying arrow of this diagonal subobject, is pretty useful because another thing it allows us to do is describe equalizers. So let's say we have a couple of arrows, F and G, from some object W to object A in our topos, and we're interested in describing the equalizer of F and G. Well, one way we can do it is we can describe it as the subobject classified by delta A after F comma G. So here, remember, delta A is just the subobject classified by this diagonal arrow, 1A comma 1A. Anyway, to see that this is the equalizer, notice that an equalizer is defined by the feature that an arrow's in it if and only if doing F after that arrow equals what you get if you, you do G after that arrow. So consider what happens when this general arrow little h is in the subobject classified by delta A after F comma G. This happens if and only if delta A after F comma G after H sends everything to true. And when we compose these, we can just take this H inside the brackets so we can rewrite this as, well, we could say that this holds if and only if delta A after FH comma GH sends everything to true. And we've already seen And we've already seen that this kind of thing happens precisely when these things in the brackets are equal. And we've already seen that this kind of thing happens precisely when these things in the brackets are equal. And so what we have then is that this statement in green holds true if and only if f after h equals g after h, which happens if and only if h is in the equalizer of f and g. So indeed, this is the equalizer of F and G. And this is a nice way we can talk about equalizers in a different kind of way using this topos theory. Okay, so you recall that we defined this for all A arrow, which was an arrow from omega to the power of A to omega. Well, according to Goldblatt, there's this way of defining a kind of similar there exists a arrow. And so I thought I'd just quickly go through this because um, when we start dealing with the mitchell benabal language, um, we'll have yet another way of making up these um, terms involving existential quantifiers. Um, but I think that this um, particular approach is kind of easier to get one's head around as far as understanding what this exists thing means in topos theory. So here's the idea. Um, we have this in A arrow that we've already encountered. And um, this is, of course, like at least in terms of points, it's picking out the subobjects paired with the points of A such that that point of A belongs to that subobject. This is kind of what we can think of as in A is doing. It's this subobject selecting these things. Um, now, what we do is we do this second projection after this in a arrow and then essentially we get the image of that so more precisely we take p2 after in a and we do an epimono factorization of it but what we're really interested in is this image of p2 after in a and the way you can think of this is it's essentially the sub-object of omega to the power of A, which at least in terms of points, it consists of all of the kind of points of omega to the power of A, which correspond to sub-objects which actually have some points inside them, okay? Hence the name, there exists A. And then all we do is we define there exists A to be the classifying arrow of this IM P2 after in A. And that's all there is to it. So if you think about what this means in the category of sets, you'll discover that essentially 
when we do this exists a arrow after a point of omega to the power of a, it'll send it to false if that point of omega to the power of a corresponds to an empty set, otherwise it'll send it to true. Okay, so topos theory is a very deep subject and there are so many results with far-reaching implications and really quite rich theories that I think maybe the best thing for me to do is to do a sort of deep dive into topos theory so that we're going to go pretty fast and not really be very rigorous. Let's just have a look at some of the most important theory and get a kind of global picture of how things fit together. So I'm mostly just going to go over definitions and point out different results that different authors have obtained, okay? Um, so a pre-order, we can think of it basically as a category where there's at most one arrow from one object to another. The usual way a pre-order is thought of is as a set. So we can think of S as the set of objects. And then this kind of, this kind of um, pre-order kind of operation. And basically when we have a pair of objects A and B, or if you like a pair of members of this set S, um, we'll write A is less than or equal to B when there is an arrow in this category from A to B. Otherwise we don't write A is less than or equal to B. So just writing this less than or equal to sign just indicates um, whether there's an arrow from one object to another in a pre-order. Now, now there's a more restricted kind of pre-order called a partially ordered set, also known as a poset. And that's just a pre-order where we have that if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, we have A equals B. In other words, it's a partially it's a partially ordered set. In other words, a partially ordered set is a pre-order where we don't have arrows going in two directions between distinct objects. Or another way to say it is that we don't have objects which are isomorphic to each other, but distinct. Okay, so the important concept for us really um, is this idea of an external hating algebra, usually just called a hating algebra. And what that is, is it's a partially ordered set um, and that has all finite products and co-products and it's Cartesian closed. So it has the exponential objects. Also, you see in my notes, I have this um, ML50. Um, this is just a sort of note um, about where I'm getting the um, information from. So this is saying I'm getting this from the book by Saunders McLean. And I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. Leek Mordike, maybe? Anyway, the book's called Sheaves in Geometry and Logic. And I'll just refer to this book as McLean. So now I want to talk about another idea, which I found on page 32 of McLean, which is basically to introduce a kind of functor uh, called sub E. And sub E is a functor from our topos E to set. I ought to make that E scripty, but I don't always do that. But anyway, um, it's a functor like this. And basically um, what it does is it sends an object of our topos E to the set of fundamentally different sub objects of that object okay um,
so I'll introduce it more gradually. So the idea then is that for every object x in our topos E, we're going to suppose that we have a sort of organization of the subobjects of x into different kind of equivalence classes. Okay, so remember two different subobjects of x uh, can be equivalent. And um, usually in topos theory, we're only really interested in the subobjects up to equivalence anyway. So we just suppose that for every sort of um, class of equivalent subobjects, we just pick one kind of representative, V star. So another way to say this is that for every arrow V from X to omega, um, we imagine we've selected one particular subobject V star of X, which has V as its classifying arrow. Okay. Um, so basically we're saying we just pick one a very fundamentally different subobject of X, and we do this for every object of E. So this just stops us having to um, this just stops us having to talk about um, you know whether things are really equivalent or equal or whatever. It makes it simpler. Um, so. what we do then we want to define this kind of functor so it's so now we want to define this kind of functor sub e so it's defined so that it sends an object x of our category e our topos e it sends x so sub e then is defined so that it sends x to the collection of sort of fundamentally different sub-objects of X, the ones we've chosen, okay? So remember, so I mean, the long way to say it is that sub E of X denotes for set of representatives of the equivalence classes of sub-objects of X. Uh, but essentially what we're saying is that, hey, we just take, um, one of each of the fundamentally different subobjects of X, and that is the sort of set that we think of sub E of X sending X to. So the value of sub E of X is just the set of fundamentally different subobjects of X. Um, now that's kind of interesting because we can put a partial order on sub e of x so in particular we have this containment operation okay um, so what we can think of is we can think that there's a kind of ordering um, on the members of sub E X, the members of this set. So if we have a sub object A in this set, so if we have a sub object A in this set and a sub object B in this set, it might be the case that A is contained in B. And this kind of idea, in this case, we'd draw an arrow from A to B. Um, and we can think of this as a kind of extra category structure on this set. In other words, we can think of sub E of X as the set of objects in a category. Well, maybe saying category is a bit too strong. I mean, really, it is a category, but it's just a partially ordered set, really. Um, so essentially, we can just think of this set sub E of X, the set of sub objects as partially ordered by containment. Um, but then if we start thinking about it, um, we notice that actually 
this kind of structure here where we have this set sub e of x um, and these elements are ordered by containment of uh, sub objects and these sort of sub objects here are ordered by this containment relation here well we find that actually this is an example of an external hating algebra okay so that's why i was introducing all of these concepts in particular uh, that's why i introduced this idea of an external hating algebra or something that um something where we have a partially ordered set and finite products and co-products and it's cartesian closed um the reason i introduced it is because this um sub e of x here this collection of fundamentally different sub objects of x basically forms one of these hating algebras when we do the ordering on it according to containment and this is really very remarkable because in this hating algebra we see all of the logical operations um, all playing together in a very nice way and it's really one of the easiest ways i think to understand about the basics of topos logic is to examine this kind of structure because it's a fairly easy kind of idea to get a grip on really you just get your object x find the fundamentally different sub objects of it and then kind of draw an arrow from a sub object v star to a sub object w star when v star is contained in w star in the sense that there exists a k such that w star after k equals v star and once you've done that um, as you'll see shortly you can basically study all of these different logical operations in a very nice simple way um, so let's discuss this now then because this we're really going to see a lot of concepts come together um, in a very pleasing way so um, suppose we have a sub object v star and a sub object w star of x and we'll suppose that these are members of sub e of x okay now we're gonna think of this thing here as a category okay because it is a category it's a it's a hating algebra so it's a partially ordered set so it can be thought of as a special kind of category a category with no parallel arrows and extra kind of structural restrictions um so since it's a hating algebra there will be a product of this pair of objects v star and w star of this category here so let's ask ourselves what is the product of v star and w star well it turns out that the product is actually just going to be the intersection of these sub objects okay so when we determine this product inside this category here the result will be another sub object but when we interpret this sort of as just a sub object of x we see that it corresponds with the intersection of v star and w star i mean this is really quite remarkable and the way we can really think about this is that v star intersection w star is really the kind of greatest lower bound of v star and w star um and that's why it kind of corresponds to the product of v star and w star now what do i mean by this well v star 
intersection W star is going to be contained in V star and it's going to be contained in W star. And so, I mean, we can think of when something is contained in something else, the thing on the left, the thing that's contained within is sort of lower in inverted commas, okay? So we can say that V star intersection W star is lower than V star and W star. So we could sort of say it's like a lower bound to them, but it's also the greatest lower bound because if we have another object, I mean, we can really think of this as a candidate in the producty kind of sense, um, something like epsilon star, um, and that's also less than or equal to V star and less than or equal to W star, then that's actually going to be less than or equal to V star intersection W star. And when I say less than or equal to, you can just convert that to meaning contained in, okay? So another way to think of this is that the intersection of two things is the kind of greatest thing, which is contained within both of those things. So it it is contained with, within both of the things you want to take an intersection of, but anything else which is contained within those two things is also contained in V star intersection W star. In a similar way, we can think of the union of these two subobjects as the least upper bound. Okay, so it turns out that the coproduct of V star and W star within this category sub E of X with this containment ordering. Well, the coproduct of V star and W star is V star union W star. And we can think of this as the kind of least upper bound of V star and W star. So again, these arrows I've drawn in represent containment. So for example, W star is contained in E star in this case. And um, we see that this V star union W star is basically just acting like the coproduct within this sort of hating algebra. And like I say, we can consider in another sense, we can consider V star union W star to be the least upper bound of V star and W star because V star is contained in V star union W star and W star is contained in V star union W star. And also, for any other kind of sub object, epsilon star, um, which also has a property that V star is contained in it and U star is contained in it, so it's also an upper bound. We have that V star union W star is contained within that E star or epsilon star, whatever we're calling it. Um, so in this sense, we can think of V star union W star as this sort of least upper bound. Okay, so here's another very interesting kind of concept. Um, and this is the idea of what exponential objects look like in this category, um, sub E of X with this containment ordering. Because I did say this is a hating algebra. I did say it has exponential objects. And here is what these exponential objects look like. So, okay then, if this sub E of X with this containment ordering really is a hating algebra, then what's the idea of an exponential object? In particular, if we pick an object of this category, W star, and raise it to the power of another object, V star, 
what do we get? Well, what we get is V star, double arrow, W star. So we've already seen this idea before. This is what McClarty calls the material implicates of W star by V star. And we've also already shown this kind of relationship that for any other kind of sub-object of X, epsilon star, we're going to have that epsilon star is contained in V star double arrow W star if and only if epsilon star intersection V star is contained in W star. And if we look at this properly, we can now see that um, really what this V star double arrow W star is, is it's a exponential object in this category. So the way that we can see this is just to note that this kind of correspondence is exactly the same as the kind of correspondence we get when we have an exponential object. So if we think of V star double arrow W star as this exponential object W star to the power of V star, then if we start with this arrow, then if we start with this idea that epsilon star intersection V star is contained in W star, what we can really think of this as in this category, sub E of X comma contained in, we can think of this as an arrow in this category, um, an arrow from the product of epsilon star and V star that goes into W star. And then treating this as an exponential object, we see that we ought to expect that there's a unique arrow from the thing on the left-hand side of this product, as in epsilon star, to the thing on the left-hand side of this product, as in V star double arrow W star, such that, you know, when we take this stuff and product it with V star, well, in this case, do the intersection of the objects with V star, it makes this triangle commute. And this is exactly what we have. We've already proved um, this essential um, sort of isomorphism which works. Um, and we've already proved this kind of essential correspondence, which is at the bottom of this, um, which is really um, telling us about how this kind of transpose operation works in this kind of category. Because what it's saying is that for a general subobject epsilon of X, we're going to have the, because I mean, the intersection is the product in this case. So we're going to have that. So, I mean, in this kind of category, this intersection is really the product in this category. And this contains in really means that there's an arrow in this category. So what this is really saying is that um, there's this arrow from the product of epsilon star and V star to W star. Um, and then we can go from that arrow to its kind of transpose, which is going to be this arrow from epsilon star to this exponential object here, W star to the power of V star. And so this is exactly this kind of um, correspondence we have for exponential objects between arrows and their transposes. And we've already proved that this result holds if we just take it on face value as a statement about subobjects. And we can see a kind of illustration of it here. So we can think about this exponential object here V star W arrow W star as at least in sets, we can think of it as the set of elements, which is, which is such that whenever there's an element in V star, that element's also in W star. So it's like this shaded green region. And then the condition for epsilon star to be contained in this green region 
um, is the same as the condition that this Epsilon star intersection with V star is contained in W star. Um, and we also see an illustration of this exponential object here. Also note for these other cases we've looked at, like the co-product. Again, we can see that this has a kind of corresponding isomorphism thing which happens for general subobjects epsilon star of x by virtue of the fact that in these kind of hating algebras um these kind of co-products are basically just least upper bounds and um again i've got a kind of graphical illustration of this at least in this case with sets but it's true more generally as well and in a similar way, actually easier to think about, um, is this case with products. Again, the fact that this product in this kind of category is essentially just acting like a greatest lower bound, essentially means that for a general subobject epsilon star of x, we have this kind of correspondence that epsilon star is going to be contained in v intersection w star if and only if epsilon star is contained in v star and epsilon star is contained in w star. This is a lot easier to understand, I think. So anyway. Um, that's what products, co-products, and exponential objects look like in this category. And then there's simpler stuff too. Um, there's the terminal object, which is simply the full subobject of X, so the identity of X essentially. Um, there's also an initial object of this category, and that's just this monomorphism into X that comes from the initial object of the category and then finally there's this negation operation which we might call not a v star and that's formally defined as so v, so the idea here is that the negation operation of v star is actually v star double arrow zero okay so i'll talk a little bit more about that later but just to summarize because this is the really interesting bits um we've gone through these different um kind of category level descriptions of different so we've gone through these different kinds of limits and co-limits and stuff um and you know how we can construct these things in this category so b of x with the containment relation and I've illustrated as I've gone through that these have interpretations of special kinds of subobjects, really kind of like generalized set operations. But the really interesting thing is that also, if we take these kind of subobjects and find the classifying arrows of them, we get logical operations. Okay, so just to summarize them. There's so much information here. Um, a product in this category here, when we interpret it as a subobject, it corresponds to the intersection of these subobjects. And then when we look at what the classifying arrows are, and then when, when we look at how we interpret this as a, and then we look, and then when we look at what classifying arrow this subobject, V star intersection W star has, we find that it's V and W, okay? Because V is the classifying arrow of V star and W is the classifying arrow of W star. In a similar way, the co-product in this category corresponds with the union of the subobjects involved. And when we get its classifying arrow, we get that this corresponds with, and then 
what we find is that the classifying arrow of this is V or W. And we've also seen this with the exponential object. It corresponds as a sub-object to V star double arrow W star. And then when we interpret, and then when we find what's the classifying arrow of this, we find that it is this material conditional arrow. which we've also seen before. This is just um, the classifying arrow of less than or equal to one. We can continue. So the terminal object here, when we interpret this as a sub object, So we can continue. So the terminal object of this category uh, corresponds to this full sub object here, the identity arrow of X. And the classifying arrow of this is T after exclamation mark X. And then kind of similarly, this initial object zero um, as a sub object, um, this just corresponds to the unique arrow from our initial object of our top os into X. But then if we uh, ask ourselves, what's the classifying arrow of a sub object, we find that it's going to be false after exclamation mark X. And then finally, um, I said that there's this negation idea. So given this subobject V star of X, we can construct this so-called negation, not of X, which is also called V star double arrow, which we can define as V star double arrow zero. Okay, so the way we'd write this in the kind of cat at the kind of category level is as zero to the power of V star. But um, when we find what's the classifying arrow of that, we find that it's V implies false. And another way that this is often written is simply as not V where not in the logical sense is written with this kind of green squiggle. So maybe I shouldn't use that there. So we could just say that the negation of V star is this arrow V star double arrow zero. Anyway, the classifying arrow of this we can then write as not V, where not is written with this squiggle. Or the literal kind of interpretation of this is that this has a classifying arrow, which is V material conditional arrow false. Okay. But we can really interpret this more clearly. by remembering this kind of relationship, because this says that some epsilon star is going to be a subobject of this thing here. Which is sort of representing the negation of V star, if and only if we have the epsilon intersection V star is empty, okay? So essentially what we're saying is that this is almost something like the complement of V star. It's not exactly the complement, but it's this sort of sub object, which has the property that 
E star is going to be contained in it if and only if E star has an empty intersection with V star. So, okay, that's a little bit about the structure of this category, sub E of X with contains in. Um, and I'm hoping that this is um, interesting to you because it, it certainly seems very interesting to me. I mean, we see so much of the goings on in top boss logic all in one place. And it's quite easy to think about what's going on because all we really have to do is get the sub objects of X and then draw arrows ordering them by containments. And then we can think about all this fascinating logic. And it's fairly easy to compute products and co-products and things like that. In fact, um, really these categories, these hating algebras have some very nice structure indeed. Um, so, for example, um, when our topos is of this form, when it's one of these categories of functors from C to set, um, there's many results about how we can use kind of adjoint functors to sort of hierarchically construct these different logical operations from one another. And there's a very nice description of this in the book Generic Figures and Their Gluings in section 7.2. Basically, in these kind of hating algebras, especially these kind, which turn out to have some nice extra properties, like they're complete in some sense, um, it's really very easy to compute adjoint functors. Um, and so we can use that to our advantage because lots of these kind of logical operations can be constructed using adjoint functors. But I mean, hopefully this is enough to sort of whet your appetite in wanting to understand the structure of uh, sub X with this containment operation. I strongly suggest you um, have a look at what this is like in set and maybe in some examples in different functor categories. Um, but like, for example, the category of graphs, but, um, I want to go on now and, um, talk about more kind of theory, um, a sort of high level, which is basically answering the question of, let's say we have, um, an arrow from X to Y an arrow F from X to Y. Well, the question is, how does that help us relate this category here, which is associated with X and the similar one, which is involving sub objects of Y. So, I mean, this is really so almost something like a kind of, um, map of the anatomy of this object X, how all its bits and pieces are stuck together and how its logic works. And there'd be a similar one with for this object Y. But if we have an arrow F between X and Y, does that allow us to kind of um, map between this structure and the kind of corresponding one representing the logic of the object Y? And the answer is a definite yes. And it's very interesting to see that connection. But I mean, we're really going towards the um, some of the most informative parts of topos theory now. So there's just so many different directions to go in. So the idea then is to think about slice categories. So for our topos E, let's pick an object X. Now the slice category that we write as E slice X um, has these arrows of category E, these arrows G that go from some object A into X. And these form the objects in this slice category. So the, so the objects of E slice X are arrows of E that go into X. Okay. 
So that's what the objects look like in this slice category. They're arrows into X. So, okay, if we have a couple of objects in this slice category, then if we're thinking of them in, then, um, so, if, so, okay, let's suppose we have a couple of objects of this slice category. Well, in that case, what do we consider to be an arrow from one of these objects to another one? Well, here's an arrow K from this object G to this object H. And so this is how we'd think of it in the slice category. But what it really is, or what it looks like in the original category E, is we can think of it as an arrow K from A to B, which is such that it makes this diagram commute. So we have the H after K equals G. Okay. Um, so there we have it. This is the idea of a slice category. And slice categories are really important for understanding lots of things about Topos theory. So um, one thing to see, um, which is uh, pretty straightforward, is, or at least you can convince yourself of it, is that when X here is a terminal object, this slice category is going to be basically isomorphic to the original category. I'll let you convince yourself of that. This result here is much harder to understand. Very important. In fact, it's sometimes called the fundamental theorem of Topos theory. And what it basically says is that whenever we have a Topos E and an object X of that Topos, we have that E slice X is another Topos. Okay, so this is a remarkably deep result. Um, because essentially, when you sort of take a slice, when you sort of make one of these slice categories, you're essentially sort of getting your topos and then constructing this new category, E slice X, which is like a new category centered. Um, it's like the, this universe from the perspective of a particular object, which forms a different kind of universe, but it's still a topos. It still has a sense of logic and all the rest of it. Um, anyway, I have this. OK, so I'm going to talk about a lot of the. Um, so I'm OK, so I'm going to very, very briefly um, talk about some of the very deep results about topos theory. But I do have an agenda, which is to reveal something about um, relations between these kind of um, sub X type um, categories, these things with these containment orderings that I've already been discussing. And the fact is that we can think of sub E of X with this containment ordering as a full subcategory of E slice X. So if we just take E slice X and then we just restrict our attention to these arrows into X, which are these sort of monomorphisms, which are, you know, these special representative monomorphisms, which are in this set, so B of X, um, then basically if we just take the full subcategory of E slice X on such objects, uh, we'll get precisely uh, this category. So we'll bear that in mind. And now let's go back to thinking about these general categories E slice X. Okay, so the way we can think of this sub E Okay, so there's different ways we can think of this sub E as a Okay, so there's different ways we can think of this sub E. When sub E operates on an object X of E, it gives the set of non-equivalent subobjects of X. And it's possible to think of those with a containment ordering, and so we can think of sub E of X as 
the set of objects in some category, some partially ordered set, which tells us how the sub-objects of X are contained in one another. But we can also think of sub E itself as a functor. OK, so we can think of it as a functor from this uh, topos E to set. And as I say, it sends every object X of E to the collection of non-equivalent sub-objects of X. Um, and it's also, it's a contravariant functor. So it operates on the arrows of E. So say we have an arrow F from an object X to an object Y in our category E. Well, when we do sub E on F, we get an arrow which goes from sub E of Y to sub E of X. So this functor is contravariant. And what arrow does sub E send F to? It sends it to this functor, which we can call F to the minus one. And essentially, this is the kind of inverse image functor. So the way it basically works is um, we can think of F to the minus one as a function from sub E of Y to sub E of X. And so it sends an element A of sub E of Y, in other words, it sends a sub-object A of Y to its pullback along F. In other words, it sends this little A here to the inverse image of A along F. And so this f to the minus 1 here, um, we can think of this as a function from this set here to this set here. But also these sets themselves, we can think of them as being ordered by this sort of containment. And this f to the minus 1 is what's sometimes called a monotonic function. It, it sort of preserves these partial orderings. So it's it's like a morphism from... Um, this partially ordered set to this partially ordered set as well. Okay, so we've been studying a bit about this. Okay, so we've been studying a bit about this kind of partially ordered set here, this kind of category, which has objects as these kind of sub-objects of x and these arrows showing us which of these sub-objects are contained in one another and it's very interesting that we've seen that this is a hating algebra and we've seen how these different logical operations can be interpreted uh, and so on in terms of these things um, but what else is very very interesting is how these things relate with one another so Suppose we have an arrow f from x to y. Well, for y, we're also going to have one of these structures. And it turns out that this arrow f can actually be used to make a kind of functor, which can be used to compare this sub x category with its containment ordering and this sub y category of its kind of containment ordering. When I say containment ordering, I just mean this way of deciding how the arrows in such partially ordered sets are laid out based on which sub objects are contained in one another, as in there's an arrow from object, as in there's an arrow from A to B when sub object A is contained in sub object B and so on. So there's a way to compare these things um using such a f and it's a very very interesting idea because we're actually able to get a functor which works really really nicely and sort of preserves all these nice hating algebra operations and allows us to kind of use general arrows like this one f from a general object x to a general object y to kind of compare this category here that kind of tells us about the anatomy of y and this category here which tells us about the anatomy of x now this functor is 
called F star and it goes from E slice Y to E slice X. Now it is maybe a bit confusing that it's called F star because I used stars up here. For example, I was denoting, I was writing V star to denote the sub object classified by V. But when I'm using stars henceforth in this kind of context, I'm talking about a functor, okay? So this is just a functor, which is called F star. And that's just a coincidence that there's a star here. This is nothing to do with um, like the interplay between classifying out. This is, this is a different thing, okay? This is basically just the name of a functor. So anyway, um, this functor F star, notice that it goes the other way around to F. So F is an arrow in our topos from object X to object Y. But F star, this so-called, the but F star is, it has a name. It's sometimes called the pullback functor. And it's a functor from E slice Y to E slice X. So it's sort of going the other way around to this arrow F in some sense. And I'm telling you that this F star is a special kind of functor. It's what's known as a logical functor. And the idea of logical functors is extremely interesting because, I mean, what are we doing in Topos theory? We have these special kind of properties of our category, of our topos, things like exponential objects, limits, and most notably, the exponential object. And what we're really interested in is how those things work and how they teach us about the structure of this category. Now, I've already told you that, now there's an interesting fact about topos theory that is, Whenever we have a topos E and an object X of E, it turns out that E slice X is also going to be a topos. So what we have here is a topos here and a topos here and this functor F star going from this topos to this topos. And I tell you that this F star is actually a logical functor. And what that means, what a logical functor is, is it's a functor which preserves subobject classifiers and it preserves limits and it preserves exponential objects and it preserves lots and lots of interesting structure. And so essentially what this means is that we can use a functor like this F star, which I'm about to describe, to understand what the essential kind of category theory machinery is in E slice X, if we know what it is in this topos, E slice Y. And um, for example, we can consider a special case, which is where Y is one. And that's very cool because E slice one, as in E sliced over the terminal object, is just going to be isomorphic to E. So in this case, the fact that this F star, which I'm about to define, the fact that this is a logical functor means we're going to be able to, if we know about, you know, the nice kind of gadgetry inside this topos E, then we can use this F star functor to find that gadgetry in this slice category here, E slice X. I'll talk more about how to do this later. Anyway, 
I think it's time I just tell you the definition of this pullback functor F star. And as I say, it happens to be a logical functor. This is not called the logical functor. It just happens to be a logical functor because a logical functor is a functor that preserves a lot of structure. And this thing I'm about to define happens to preserve a lot of structure. Um, so anyway, how is F star defined? Well, it obviously sends objects and arrows in E slice Y to objects in, and arrows in E slice X. And the way that F star works on an object G dash of E slice Y is basically that it sends it to the pullback of G dash along F star. Oh, is that it sends G dash to the pullback of G dash along F. Okay, so let me explain this more carefully. What is an object of E slice Y? Well, in the original category, in the original category E, we can interpret an object of E slice Y as an arrow, G dash, that goes into Y. Okay, and we also have this arrow F, which is this arrow from X to Y. And what I'm saying is that to find F star of G dash, what we basically do is just pull back this arrow G dash along F. So we're forming a kind of pullback square. And then this arrow we get, the kind of arrow opposite G dash in this pullback square, this is what we call F star G dash. So that's basically why uh, this functor F star is called the pullback functor because it sends an object G dash of E slice Y to the pullback of G dash along F. So sometimes I'll call the pullback of G dash along F, F to the minus one of G dash. Now, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should reserve this notation for the case where G dash is a monomorphism. But anyway, um, the point is basically just the F star of G dash is the pullback of G dash along F. So now we know how F star works on objects of E slice Y. The other thing I need to tell you, of course, so you understand how this pullback functor works is how does F star work on arrows of E slice Y? Well, remember, an arrow K dash of E slice Y, like, for example, this one here, which goes from G dash to H dash, what this really looks like in the category E is it's going to be this arrow K dash from A dash to B dash that makes this triangle commute. So... Here we've got a picture of E slice Y. So here are a couple of objects, G dash and H dash. And here's this arrow K dash from G dash to H dash. Now, um, what happens when we apply this functor F star? Well, we're going to change G dash to become this arrow here. Well, we're going to change G dash to become this arrow here. F star of G dash. Well, we're going to change G dash to become this arrow here. 
F star of G dash, which is just the pullback of G dash along this arrow F. And similarly, we're going to um, send this object H dash of E slice Y to this object F star of H dash of E slice X. And thinking in the category E, we can think that this is just the arrow obtained by pulling back H dash along this arrow F. So that's fine. But what about this arrow K dash? We thought of this arrow K dash, uh, which in the category E just looks like this arrow from A dash to B dash. We thought of that really in the category E slice Y as this arrow from G dash to H dash. So what is F star of K dash. Well, to understand this, we really need to understand a certain kind of pullback lemma. I'll put a time code for when I mention this in my video on pullbacks on the screen so you can look it up. Um, or you can have a look in Colin McClarty's book, Elementary Categories, Elementary Toposes on page 46 where he proves this result. But essentially the kind of lemma we're gonna use is as follows. It says that when we have a commuting triangle like this one with the black and green arrows, and when we have this kind of orange arrow coming into the object Y of our commuting triangle where the kind of arrows point to, and when we have pullback squares formed with this orange arrow Y and either of these black arrows coming into. And when we have pullback squares formed with this orange arrow F, and these kind of black arrows coming into Y. So in other words, when we have two pullback squares involving the red, orange, black and blue arrows in this picture. So in particular, in this case, when this is a pullback square and when this is a pullback square, in those cases, we have something quite interesting that happens. In those cases, there's going to exist a unique arrow, a purple arrow like this, which is such that it makes this top triangle commute. So in this case, A dash dash B dash dash X. And also it makes this back square into a pullback square. And that unique arrow that makes all that stuff happen, that's what we define to be F star of K dash. So if you really want to understand this pullback font or F star, then of course you need to know how it works on arrows. And I would recommend you check out some of these sources so you can see a proper description of how it works. But anyway, that's a description of this important pullback functor. Now, there's a lot of very interesting theory related to this that helps one to understand a lot about toposes. And I'm not really going to go into um, some of it in, but I'm, there's so, okay, so there's so much theory uh, around this kind of pullback functor F star. And I don't really want to get too distracted at the moment. So I'm just going to very briefly mention that um, this functor F star, this pullback functor, it has a left adjoint, which is usually called sigma F, and it has a right adjoint that's usually called pi F. And these are very interesting 
for kind of comparing slice categories and for kind of sending information backwards and forwards. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really want to get too much into those at the moment, but it's well worth having a look at. Maybe I'll mention them more in subsequent videos. But the real point is that this functor F star preserves a lot of the important structure of these toposes, these slice categories, E slice Y and E slice X. And um, this can be fairly important from a, a rather sort of practical point of view, because let's say you have some topos that you know a lot about, like let's say the category of sets. Okay, we know what the subobject classifier is in that category. We know what the exponential objects are, etc. But now let's suppose you pick an object in sets and you want to think about set slice X. Well, um, I've told you that doing a slice over any well, I've told you that slicing a topos over any object gives you another topos. So that means that set slice X is a topos. But how do you know about its its structure? Um, how do you know what the kind of sub object classifier is of this category or its exponential objects? Well, basically, um, you can just use this functor f star because f star preserves exponentials subobject classifiers limits it preserves the way that logic works it preserves loads of fascinating things about the um, topos and what you can do is you can just consider a special case of this functor okay so what about if your arrow f this arrow f from x to y, what about if we had the case where y is the terminal object? Well, in that case, f would just be an arrow from x to the terminal object. So we could even just call f exclamation mark x in that case. But now let's think about what the pullback functor is going to be in that kind of case. And here's the thing, we know that F star is this functor from E slice Y to E slice X. But also in this case where Y is the terminal object, we know that E slice Y is just gonna be isomorphic to E itself, okay? So in this case, F star is this kind of um, structure preserving functor, this logical functor, which is going to be able to take things like the subobject classifiers and exponential objects and interesting kind of toposy information that we know about E, and it's going to be able to tell us where this stuff lives in E slice X. And it also turns out that in this special case where Y is a terminal object, the form of this functor f star is actually pretty simple. In fact, in this case, people usually don't write f star. They normally call this functor x star in this case. I mean, maybe a better name for it might be um, exclamation mark x star because it's just this case where f is exclamation mark x. But anyway, um, so, how do we work with x so how do we work with this kind of pullback functor in this case well in this case things are much simpler because basically this kind of functor x star which is basically just f star in this special case here well this functor x star has really a very simple kind of definition Basically, the way it works is just that for an object A in this topos E, we have that X star of A is just going to be the 
categorical product of X and A. So that's how X star works on objects of E. How does X star work on arrows of E? Well, let's suppose we have an arrow U from object A to object B in E. Well, X star is just gonna send U to this first projection arrow, P1, okay? Which is just this familiar projection arrow from X times A to X, okay? So really, X star here is a very simple kind of functor to work with, but it has the very nice feature that it kind of preserves all of this interesting kind of topos theory structure. So I'm really just kind of scratching the surface of um, these kind of correspondences that happen uh, between these slice categories. And I, I don't want to get too much into it at the moment because I have other things that I want to talk about. Um, but I mean, basically, what we can do with all of this stuff is that if we have a category E, a topos E that we know about, if we can find out about what our, what's its sub-object classifier, what's its exponential objects look like, etc., the kind of thing that we can do when we have a category like set to the power of C, for example. Well, if we can do that, then we can use this kind of approach in order to understand the structure of these categories where we slice E uh, over different objects, X in E. And then for other kinds of arrows, like um, just a general arrow, F from X to Y, we can use kind of general functors like this to kind of understand how these slice categories compare with each other. And also in general, such an F star has this left and right adjoint, which also, and these functors also give us a lot of information about kind of like how E slice X and E slice Y compare with. Okay, so once we understand about this idea of this kind of pullback functor F star, um, it gives us a very interesting way to sort of combine together lots of the things we're interested in into some really kind of super functor that does loads of things. So the basic idea is sort of, it's a bit like what we did with sub E when we thought of that as a functor from E to set, but we can almost think of this as something almost like, kind of like a restriction of this case here I'm about to discuss. So the idea here is that we define this functor S from our topos E to cats, this category of categories. And it works like this. It sends an object X of E to the slice category, E slice X. And it sends an arrow F from X to Y to this functor F star, which is a functor from S of Y to S of X. So this is a contravariant functor and it has a very lot of nice structure. I'm not going to talk about it much, but I just wanted to point it out because it's a very fascinating thing to look at. But anyway, I want to get on to... But anyway, I want to start to apply these ideas about F star to understand the issue I was talking about before, which is how can we use an arrow F from X to Y to compare this kind of category of sub-objects of Y with the kind of containment ordering with the other category like this, but for X, okay, this other category sub E of X with containment ordering. So how can we use this arrow F to compare such things? Well, the point 
is to notice that this category here, this kind of category of sub-objects of Y, is really just a kind of full subcategory of E slice Y. You see, the objects of sub E Y um, are really just these kind of specially chosen monomorphisms into Y. And so if we just get E slice Y and restrict our attention to such objects, such monomorphisms into Y, then um, the arrows between such objects in E slice Y are just going to be these kind of arrows which are sort of proving, for example, that A is contained in B, okay? A is contained in B if and only if there's an arrow K from A to B in E slice Y for these sub objects A and B in Y. And when there is an arrow, there's just going to be one. Okay, this single kind of monomorphism K that proves that A is contained in B. And so that's what I mean when I say that this thing here is a full subcategory of E slice Y. I mean that if we just pick these sub objects, um, I mean that if we just pick these monomorphisms in this kind of set here, and then we just look at E slice Y, but just restricted to those kind of objects of E slice Y and keep all the arrows between them, we will basically get this category, this category of sub objects of Y with this containment ordering thing. And so that's kind of interesting. But what's more interesting is that if we actually just restrict this functor F star, if we just restrict it to the kind of full subcategory, this sub E Y kind of full subcategory of E slice Y, then basically, we get another functor, a functor that we might call f to the minus one. And this is a functor from sub e of y to sub e of x. So how does this functor work? Well, it pretty much works like f star, okay? So, um, if we have an object of sub e y, we can think of that as just a monomorphism which goes into y. Now we also have this arrow f from x to y, and when we do this f to the minus one functor on this object a of this category here, the result we get is just the pullback of A along F. So we could call this F to the minus one of A. And, you know, another way we can think of this is, is the kind of inverse image of this subobject A along F. So this gives us a very interesting functor. Now, it is a kind of monotonic map. It is a proper functor from this category to this category. It preserves kind of, in other words, this inverse image operation preserves the kind of containment relations of the monomorphisms involved. But more than that, this preserves a lot of other structure. And that's basically because it's just the restriction of F star which preserved so much structure. So in fact, it's quite remarkable that this f to the minus one functor here preserves all hating algebra operations, okay? So this is really, I think it's absolutely amazing. It's like um, 
just for any object x in our category. We have all of this kind of logical structure, which we can think about. And for any arrow at all, from one object to another, any arrow f from x to y, um, we have this corresponding kind of functor. f to the minus 1 here, which allows us to be able to sort of um, find out how this kind of logical structure of the different parts of this object y um, correspond with the logical structure of the parts of this object x when we operate this arrow f. So this is really very remarkable. And I mean, there's even more results about this. So for example, um, it turns out that if we take the left adjoint to this functor f to the minus one, we get this functor here, which we might call their exist subscript f. And that turns out to be very useful. We'll use this kind of idea or make contact with it when we talk about the mitchell benabau language. And also if we take the right adjoint of f to the minus one, we get another functor, which we could call for all subscript f, which again is very useful for sort of understanding about topos logic. Just to say quickly how this there exists f functor works, basically for a subobject a of x, this there exists f functor sends that a to the image of f after a. And we're going to use this kind of idea later to shed some light on how existential quantifiers work in toposes. Okay, so when we've got this left adjoint to f to the minus one, this exists f arrow, and also this right adjoint this for all arrow okay so when we've got these functors this there exists f left adjoint to f to the minus one and this for all f this right adjoint to f to the minus one we can actually use these things to make sense of some of the concepts we've already encountered now um i'm sort of um rushing through this um video a bit and there's so much content and um I must admit this next thing I'm going to say in the next minute is not something I've um, checked over thoroughly. So take this with a pinch of salt. But um, I think this um, for all they are um, arrow, which we already encountered, sort of idea of encoding this uh, universal quantification. I think we can... write this as for all p1 r okay so um when we have this relation r this sub object of b times a of course p1 is an arrow from b times a to b and um if we use p1 as our f in this functor here this right adjoint um and we do that on R, I think this gives us this for all a R arrow, which I described earlier. Um, and then there's also another thing. So again, for this type of um, relation R, there's also this sort of existential uh, version, which we'll see, um, we'll see this discussed more systematically when when we do the mitchell benabau language in the next video but um there's this sort of other thing which is a bit like for all they are but it's there exists they are and i believe that we can think of that as in terms of this left adjoint here this there exists f thing with f equals p1 um as there exists subscript p1 of r and then 
the way we can think of this, you see, we have this way of interpreting there exists f of a. So there exists p1 of r, we can interpret as the image of p1 of r. So here's a little example in the category of sets. So we have this relation r, which we can think of as a subset of b times a in the category of sets. And then if we take the If we do P1 on this relation, that kind of collapses things down onto B. And if we take the image of that, that basically selects the subset of B that have things sent to them. Um, so we can think of this as the image of P1 of R, which is basically um, this kind of subset of B, which is such that there exists an A uh, that's in relation R with such a B. So it sort of makes sense. But, um, you know, all this stuff, um, just take it with a bit of a pinch of salt. And now I'll get on to things that I'm a bit more, uh, that I've checked more rigorously. So I'll also just very briefly say another rather cryptic note, which is... So let me also just very, very briefly... So let me also just say that the way that we got at our definition of for all they are was um, to consider an arrow from omega to the power of a to omega, which we called for all a. And we defined this as the classifying arrow of the name of true. Now, um, if, now, now I think that basically getting at this for all idea in this way is sort of like an internalized version of this kind of approach to getting at this universal quantifier using the kind of power object, which is sort of like an internalized version of um, the external kind of sub A thing. And also there's a corresponding way to get at an arrow from omega to the power of A to omega, which gives us the existential quantifier. And I think if you have a look on page 245 of Robert Goldblatt's book, Topoi, the categorical analysis of logic, he defines such an arrow for existence. I'd like to... Okay, so I think that that's enough for this video. I'd like to emphasize that the stuff at the beginning of the video, um, up until... So, okay, so I think that's enough for this video because I'd like to keep things pretty concrete. But, um, one, th but one thing I'd like to say is that I think that this kind of hating algebra that's formed by looking at the different sub-objects of X is a very interesting thing. And there's actually something that I think is quite a bit more interesting, which is really, um, in my opinion, where this kind of structure comes from. Because in my opinion, this kind of structure it's sort of external in a sense. I mean, um, it's not entirely living within the topos we're studying. We're kind of looking at the topos, we're looking at the different sub-objects of X, and then we're kind of imagining building this kind of pre-order to show which sub-objects are, which are, are in which other sub-objects and so on. And um, the thing is that there's actually similar information that's really internally contained within the topos. And um, this is really, really interesting because um, it's kind of a natural place where this structure of, so <clears throat> because it's really the kind of natural place where this kind of structure of sub-objects of X kind of lives in a sense. And um, essentially what I'm talking about is that 
if we consider this object here, the so-called power object, omega to the power of x, um, there's more to this than what I'm about to say, but naively speaking, we could think of omega to the power of x as um, a kind of internalization of the collection of arrows from x to omega. And arrows from x to omega correspond to subobjects of x. Now, it turns out that if we can find a certain type of relation on omega to the power of x, and I mean relation in the kind of generalized sense, so I really mean a kind of subobject of omega to the power of x times omega to the power of x, then this thing here is really the kind of ultimate internal way of representing the idea of subobjects being contained within one another. Okay, I'll let you think about how that might be the case. Now, um, essentially what we can do then is we can study the kind of this information about um, this kind of collection of subobjects of X and which ones are contained within each other and all the logic and everything. We can study all that, but in a sort of purer sense by looking at how all this stuff is represented internally within the category as a sort of power object. And that's because we can essentially make this thing, which turns out to be something called a internal hating algebra. Okay. An internal hating algebra object, if you like. Um, and so I was originally, when I was making this video, I wanted to include a um, description of how to do that. Um, but I have been finding it difficult to make a very sort of um, concise description of it that's easy to follow. I mean, if you have a look in McLean and Mordike's book, Sheaves in Geometry and Logic, um, around about page 198, they do go through this. And um, it's very, very interesting, but they use quite a lot of heavy machinery, um, hom functors and so on to do it. And so I have attempted a different approach to construct this kind of thing. And you can see it's, and you can, if you, and if you're interested in learning about that, you can have a look at my unlisted and if you're interested in learning that, you can click on the video link um, in the description to this video. I've made an unlisted YouTube video describing this stuff briefly. Okay then, so since... Okay then, so since this idea of this sort of category where we take all this sub... Okay, so since this idea is an important one, this notion that we find a kind of category which has these fundamentally different subobjects as okay so we see that this idea which is that we form this kind of category of fundamentally different subobjects of x and we give them a kind of ordering or we draw arrows between such objects according to this containment relation. We see that this idea is fairly important because we can understand a lot about topos theory and about how these different logical operations are related to one another in these terms. In fact, I'm not really doing full justice to the theory. There's, there's a very rich theory about how one can use ideas like adjoint functors to sort of get one of these logical operation ideas from other ones and so on that Levere developed. Um, anyway, this is a very rich structure. So it's natural to kind of ask, where does it come from? And I think there's sort of two possible answers to that. So one possible answer 
is that you can sort of think of this as a special case of something that you can get by thinking about what's known as intuitionistic propositional logic. So what you can essentially do in that kind of setup is take a set of sentences S in such a propositional language And then we can think of the objects as different members of that set of sentences. So what we can essentially do, we can take So what we can essentially do is we can take intuitionic so, okay, so what we can essentially do, okay, so there's a couple of different approaches to sort of understand what kind of beast this is. One way is to construct something that's kind of similar by thinking about logic. So let's think about intuitionistic propositional calculus for a moment. If we take some propositional language L, then let's say we pick a set of sentences S. Now, what we can basically think of is that we form a category where the objects are sentences in this propositional language L. And then the basic idea is that we draw an arrow from an object P to an object Q as in a sentence we draw an arrow from a sentence P to a sentence Q when using these sentences S and we draw such an arrow when we can use these sentences S uh, together with P to prove Q. And we can actually think of this arrow here as a proof um, that we can imply Q given P and this set of sentences S. In this in the intuitionistic propositional calculus. So in this kind of thinking, uh, one thinks of the, so in this kind of thinking, one's essentially thinking of the, objects of the, as, so in this kind of thinking, one's essentially thinking of the objects as sentences and arrows as proofs and arrow composition can be considered to be sort of concatenating proofs, sticking them together to make longer proofs. So this is the idea of a syntactic category and it's not identical really, but it's, it's closely related to this idea of our category here that has sub-objects of X as its objects, which are... So this idea here of a syntactic category is not identical, but it's 
closely related to this idea of us forming a category that has objects as the sub-objects of x, fundamentally different ones, and an arrow from one such object to another when the first corresponding sub-object is contained within the second. So that's one way we can think about this kind of category of sub-objects. But there's another way to think about it, which I think is very kind of refreshing, um, because it essentially, I mean, the way that we've discussed this so far, we sort of constructed it um, from an almost sort of external perspective. I mean, we imagined ourselves um, up above the category and able to look it's the different sub objects of X and able to test whether, you know, which ones are contained within which other ones and able to sort of draw out um, this kind of partially ordered set using that kind of thinking. Um, but really, I'd say that the way that this lovely structure comes about is it's sort of just a reflection of some very nice kind of internal structure within the category. Okay, so if you think about what a partially ordered set is, I mean, essentially, it is a, I mean, essentially, it consists of a set of objects, let's say, S. I mean, essentially, it consists of a set of objects, let's say, mu and then there's really a relation on mu there's a way of choosing certain pairs of objects of mu so we could say um, that the partial order is really specified by a kind of sub object of mu times mu now that's the way that we describe this kind of partial order in set when mu is just an object in set, when mu is just a set. Um, and that's the normal way we think about partial orders, but it's possible to think of something called an internal partial order, which is basically just the same idea, but when mu is just an object in our topos. So then it's really the kind of notion of a partial order which is internal to the topos it's not necessarily you know selecting um a load of ordered pairs which have certain conditions you know this kind of less than or equal to thing that we can check element wise like we can in set but it's essentially the similar idea that we think well we've got a a sub object of that object product with itself and it has and it satisfies these different conditions, which are the sort of analogies of the type of conditions that we want a partial order to satisfy when we're thinking of an ordinary external one using set theory. And so this is the idea of an internal partial order. And one can go further. There's also this idea of an internal hating algebra. And the really nice idea is that it turns out that this power object omega to the power of x we can actually put a kind of relation on that we can find a sort of sub object of omega times x times omega times x uh, which i'm calling less than or equal to x um, which essentially does does this for us it gives us a internal hating algebra so this is a kind of sub object of omega to the power of x times omega to the power of x and we can really think of it sort of like the analogy of this kind of containment ordering uh, because it gives us what's called an internal hating algebra and this has many lovely properties so i have a go at constructing this uh, using a sort of novel method 
of um, exponentiated arrows in the videos in the description um, but there's a there's another way to do it which is discussed at some length in Saunders McLean and Mordyke's book Sheaves in Geometry and Logic uh, on page 201 um, but I'm just going to briefly say the kind of structure this thing has So I'll just sketch briefly how this kind of correspondence can work. So I'm just going to sketch briefly how we can think of getting things like this category of sub-objects by considering this kind of power object of its internal ordering. So the basic idea is that once we have this kind of internal ordering um, of this power object, and I give a a sort of rough go at saying how to construct this kind of thing for omega to the power of x in the videos in the description. Um, well, the idea then is basically as follows. We have a sort of isomorphism between this category of sub-objects on w times x with this containment ordering and this kind of category of arrows from w to omega to the power of x with this less than or equal to x kind of relation used to order them um and so very briefly the way that this works is that given a couple of arrows a transpose and b transpose from w to omega to the power of x we may have the the pair a transpose comma b transpose is are in this kind of relation and In that case, of course, we can write A transpose comma B transpose is in this less than or equal to X relation. And then the cor this will correspond to the case where the subobject classified by A is contained in the subobject classified by B. And that's the sort of essence of this isomorphism here. And so it's very interesting to think about this case because one starts to see that this sort of category of subobjects really just emerges as a kind of reflection of this true kind of internalized um, way that all of this stuff is present in our actual category um, in this kind of form. So for example, if you set this object W to be a terminal object, then what you've got going on on the right is just um, a sort of ordering of the, then what you've got going on on the right is a sort of partial ordering of the arrows from one to omega to the power of x and we know very well that such arrows from the terminal object one to omega to the power of x just really correspond to sub-objects of x and then on the left hand side in this case you just have uh, something that corresponds to just the category of sub-objects of x with this kind of containment ordering And so it turns out that this thing here is what's called an internal hating algebra. And we can think about the different things going on in logic and all the rest of it in this kind of setup. In fact, things work even better in this kind of setup because in some sense it's more natural. And one can also have notions like the idea of
internal adjoint functors, which is again a kind of internalization of the idea of adjoint functors. It's the ability to talk about adjoint functors, but I mean, essentially, you can. It's not just these relations that you can think of as being internalized. It's not just partially ordered sets. You can think of categories being internalized, as in, you can think about sort of objects um, that are in categories that have all the same kind of relations as, that have all the same kind of properties as categories do when you would set up the idea of a category in terms of set theory, you know, all the ways you'd set up the idea of a category, um, you can sort of define as saying, well, you know, you've got um, this object in the category of sets that has this relation and blah, blah, blah. You can define all of that stuff um, in this kind of, you can take all of those kind of definitions um, and look at how they're written in set theory and then translate them into category theory and come up with a sort of internalized idea of what a category is. So you can essentially You know, just like you'd normally define a category as a kind of set of objects and a set of arrows that satisfy certain properties, you can then think of a kind of internalized version of a category where you have a sort of object representing the objects in your category and an object representing the arrows in your category. And the different relations that you need to define a category are then um, internalized and become things like um, these sorts of relations. So we can do all that kind of thing and we can get all sorts of notions from category theory internalized. So I've basically been talking about the idea here of internalizing the notions of partial orders and hating algebras and things like that. But you can internalize the idea of categories. You can internalize the idea of functors. You can internalize the idea of adjoints and then when you have this kind of thing, um, just like you can sort of bootstrap and get the different logical operations um, involved in this sub X with the containment ordering um, by keeping using adjoint functors. Actually, I haven't uh, elaborated on that theory much, but it's possible, okay? And you can do a similar thing here for this kind of internal hating algebra. And that's a fairly useful thing to be able to do because it gives us a way to sort of get at the important logical operations on here. In fact, there's many ways that you can do this. Um, but yeah, so that's a sort of very, very fast and somewhat rough and ready kind of uh, introduction to the idea of internal hating algebras and how they have a part to play in topos theory uh, as power objects. Okay, so we've already encountered, um, for example, this um, exists a arrow here, which is an arrow from omega to the power of a to a. Okay, so we've already encountered this, there exists a arrow here, which is a arrow from omega to the power of a to omega. And we've also encountered this for all a arrow earlier. And um, these things are going to be useful to us later on. Um, but there's a result in McLean, which I think ties these together. But I must admit, I have not gone through the details of this. So what I'm about to say could really be considered conjecture because I simply haven't checked the theory behind it yet. Um, but here's the way I think it works as far as I can um, see so far. Um, for an arrow f from x to y in our topos, um, we can consider this arrow omega to the power of f to be a morphism um, from omega to the power of y with its ordering less than or equal to y to this object 
omega to the power of x with its ordering less than or equal to x. So these are basically interning, so these are basically internal hating algebras. And we can consider this omega to the power of f as a kind of morphism of such. Um, now that's going to have a left adjoint and a right adjoint. And we call those exists f and for all f. Now this is not to be confused with, um, we also use these there exists and for all um, notations for arrows which appeared as left and right adjoints involving um, involving this kind of category of subobjects, sub e of x. But um, this is a different thing, okay? We're talking now about internal adjoints and internal hating algebras. Um, anyway, in the case where y here is a terminal object, um, this arrow f, of course, will be an arrow I mean, in that case, when we have that y is terminal, then we'll have that f is equal to exclamation mark x. And also in that case, we will have that omega to the power of y will basically just be isomorphic to omega because raising omega to the power of a terminal object just gives us something isomorphic to omega. So in that case, we have that there exists f, which in our case will be exists exclamation mark x. Um, we can essentially consider it to be an arrow from omega to the power of x. to omega and similarly with for all and i believe this is basically how we define or at least i imagine this is how we define um one way we can define these kind of things like there exists a and there and for all a um as these arrows from the power object well okay i'm using x's down here but my claim is that this for all x thing um, and this there exists x thing can be thought of in this sense that <clears throat> when we take this kind of setup that I've just described and set f equals exclamation mark x then the kind of left internal left adjoints we get to this morphism here um, that via this notation we would call exists exclamation mark x is what Goldblatt here would basically define as there exists x if we just sort of replace these a's with x's here etc and in a similar way we came up with this sort of definition of for all x up here um, this was basically following McClarty um, but again I think that If one takes this kind of setup and one picks f equal exclamation mark x then this kind of for all f thing that one gets as the internal right adjoint of omega to the power of f in this case um, I think that basically gives us this for all x arrow which is corresponding to what McClarty described. But like I say, this is something that wants checking properly.